Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the annual Socialist Action Spring Education Conference. We acknowledge that this gathering takes place on the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and Audenoshani people and on indigenous lands of Turtle Island. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. We are delighted to be online with all of you and those who will watch the proceedings later via YouTube. This conference is education that leads to action. The need for action is more urgent than ever. The main trends in the world and domestic political situations are disturbingly clear. Global inequality is growing, made worse by high inflation and low productive investment by capital. COVID still grips much of humankind. Environmental catastrophe stalks the planet. Imperialist states and their clients invest in the doomsday machinery of conventional and nuclear weaponry and conduct endless wars. What do workers want? We want and demand proper health care, a living wage for all, an end to the imperialist war in Ukraine, an end to destruction of the environment, no to austerity, and a halt to big business rule. How will we get that? Only by making a socialist revolution led by mass revolutionary workers party, which socialist action aspires to be. We hope this conference shows you what the next step forward are. My name is Elizabeth Bice and I'm a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, the Federal Treasurer of the NDP Socialist Caucus and a leading member of Socialist Action on Euros today. Currently, we are celebrating the 29th anniversary of the founding of Socialist Action in Canada. If you want to change the world, please get directly involved in our party. We warmly invite you to join Socialist Action. You are in for a real treat. There are three total topical discussion sessions, each with a panel of two or three dynamic and thought-provoking speakers. At 1 p.m., which is now, of course, we, the topic is why I became a revolutionary. The speakers are Flo Shade, Emily Sears, and Victor Morgan. At 4 p.m., it's Eastern Standard Time, what is democratic centralism with Gary Porter and Ellen Smith. At 7 p.m., the transitional program, how to win and how to work in the NDP and unions. The speakers are Barry Wiseletter, Julius R. Scott, and once again, Flo Shade. And now for the opening panel on why I became a revolutionary. The first speaker is Flo, and she's a leading member of Socialist Action in the NDP Socialist Caucus, a mother, writer, and researcher who resides in Terrace, British Columbia. Welcome, Flo. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Semshian people, and I'm just going to talk for a while about how and why I became a revolutionary. So I came to the revolutionary movement in the same manner as many others. I think, from a place of frustration and despair, with an undeniable impulse to do something about it. For some personal backstory, I've always been interested in social justice issues, active throughout high school and getting into more organized forms of activism and protest at university during the Great Recession and Occupy years. It's interesting to look back and reflect on that time now. I have a feeling I'm not the only one with perhaps a similar trajectory in that cohort. There was a rumbling consciousness in the air and the feeling that things were hitting a crescendo, that the status quo was not sustainable, that something had to change. And then something apparently did. Obama got elected. And I'm disappointed now to say that I fell for it, mostly. Hope and change was promised and looked actionable exactly when we needed it. And with this momentous occasion, which was sold to us as a historic turning point, I think a lot of people took their eye off the ball. I know I did. My time in undergrad, I was stuck pretty firmly in the social democracy with some rad lib tinges, always running right up to the line of class consciousness or investigating in circles around political economy and labor value, but always being thrown off the socialist scent by academic jargon about practicality, politics, and critiques of impropriety or extremist apologia. I became very disillusioned with the capacity to really change the system in radical ways because I had gone in to see the belly of the beast. 
I had experienced firsthand the brainwashing and selfishness of the market fetishists in business management classes. And lacking any other strong counter narrative that wasn't prepackaged as small scraps of Marx the sociologist or Marx the religious scholar, it was hard to imagine how this atomized, ideas based form of resistance could make a real dent in the structure of the mega machine, which was just hardening into that global aristocratic class we're so familiar with today. So, in my postgraduate studies and travels, I got busy trying to figure out adulting and maybe trying to build a career. I focused on my own world and even met the person I'd start a family with. I had a naive hope, although even then, not without suspicion, but more because I didn't know what else to do, that the grown-ups in the room represented by the supposedly left-leaning contingent led by Obama and Trudeau had apparently won some systemic power and were going to do something halfway decent with it while I left the organizing world behind and tried to secure something of a life for myself. That said, it's a lot easier to be an activist when you're on a campus too. Then I had my first child in 2016 and the realization of that hope having no chance of becoming true came fast and furious. Around these years, we saw the swift fraudulence and betrayal of the Trudeau liberals and Obama Democrats, their deep hypocrisy, bald faced lies and their bad faith arguments exposed society, exposed as society continued to deteriorate. Polarization became the norm. Historic events began to happen regularly. Imperialist drones and bombs continued to kill civilians around the world and wildfires sprung up across the country and ravaged communities by my doorstep for the first time. We saw the rise of Trump and the public castigation of Bernie and the shadows cast by the changing world order were becoming undeniably clear. Shortly after my son was born and the fog was slowly beginning to lift from postpartum depression, my radicalization arc really began based on a whole other type of despair. This of course was the type of world I just brought my children into. I remember some time in 2019 when it really landed on me that the reality of climate change was already here and that my kids would not grow up with the same relationship to the natural world that I had. The summers had always been the best time for us kids. School was out, it was warm enough to walk outside without a car, oh, without a coat. But as the sky rained down <laughs> with ashes, <laughs> I remember feeling fear about what each summer would bring. Each season with its increasingly dangerous storms and wondering when it will really get too hot outside and everyone will stay indoors the whole summer with air conditioning on if you were lucky enough to have it. It was a period of deep grief, mourning for a world I was not ready to let go of, but that I had to recognize was already past. We kept struggling, working, studying, moving, grinding, trying to better ourselves and our situation. But nothing has been easy since we became a family been an uphill battle to try and maintain basic stability and quality of life. Things really came to a head for me, like many I imagine, when so many extraordinary things began to happen in 2020. There was a hope, a light, a possibility in the campaign of Bernie Sanders, and with an unparalleled ruthlessness and audacity, the world watched as a democratic establishment lined up to manipulate the system and kill his campaign. That was the final straw for me. It occurred at the same time that I had re-entered the workforce in the social work field and was already burning out from the notion that I, if I just worked hard enough, I could do some real good. Then, of course, we had the unprecedented pandemic and the rise of Black Lives Matter, mass protests. All of a sudden, the normal vestiges of society seemed to be coming apart at the seams. While it was overwhelming and a bit scary, I think a lot of us welcomed the opportunity that such uncertainty brought to recreate the world in a better and more fair image. The implacable barriers which had delimited the possibilities of our lives for so long were revealed to be little more than platonic forms, shadows on the cave wall, constructs which held their power only through the collective misguided beliefs in them. It became painfully clear to me that the levers of power had become so concentrated and pervasive that any democratic reform, which actually got close to touching that authority or challenging that jurisdiction, was basically dead on arrival. In this case, when the status quo structures have such an intensive stranglehold on every aspect of society, one is left with little choice other than to become a revolutionary. In the simplest terms, it means to be advocating for a revolution or a complete transformation of society. It became very clear to me that there would be no movement, nothing of substance or structural significance whatsoever that would be born through the channels provided by the powerful. Any incursion into their authority would be considered radical 
and even tepid widespread democratic reforms would require a revolution in the political economy in order to break the stranglehold and make any progress realizable. In a context like this, any serious change maker has to accept that they must also be a revolutionary because there is no room for change in this authoritarian hellscape capitalism has wrought. What I learned later through study and struggle in Marxism is that capitalism was always and has always been destined for such a fate and that the ebbs and flows of democracy and egalitarianism in a society are based proportionally on how much and how far revolutionary socialism is able to impact it. So I started my foray into socialism, communism, and anarchism, as many do, on Twitter, while on a leave from the workforce. <laughs> due to I had a lot of time to scroll, and right there was an accessible community of leftists, arguing with each other, but also spreading lots of new information. Thus began my introduction into the wacky world of the many leftist isms, all the theory to catch up on and this sense like I should find the right ism for me so I could paste it on my profile like all the other wandering souls on the bird site. I decided the most popularly known brand of communism associated with Stalin and the Soviet Union was a little too problematic for me. Anarchism I liked the sounds of but was still hard to understand in practice. Libertarian socialism seemed to be a decent middle ground placeholder that was endorsed by the likes of Chomsky. So this was the ism I settled in for a while. After a few months of screaming into the social media void and educating myself on history of, on the history and reality of financial imperialism, I decided it was time to put all this pent up angst into practice and join an organized revolutionary movement. Shopped around the socialist organizations in Canada and reached out to the communist party, fight back and socialist action. Between all of these organizations, I felt socialist action had the most nuanced, real, and grounded connection between theory, solidarity, and practice. I was in a fight back reading group, which was useful, but I found the conversations dogmatic, unimaginative, and reductionist. The CP constitution had some decent changes in their view of Stalin, but their online presence felt quite inauthentic, rigid, and at times antisocial. Joining socialist action was definitely the right move for me. I quickly began reading Marxist theory and being asked to share my thoughts on it. I saw in practice what the notion that consciousness is developed through action meant and went on to discover how tactics are born through the struggle. I'd say I was learning about Trotsky's seminal piece, The Transitional Program, which really swayed me to give up the libertarian socialist moniker and embrace full-blown Trotskyism. I found an intellectual home in the work of Trotsky and Lenin, which demonstrated a commitment to nuance, realism, and principled flexibility. This tendency was able to address the critiques of Stalinist bureaucracy while not abandoning core principles of historical dialectics or democratic centralism, keeping it grounded in theory and committed to practice. Compared to all the online discourse and leftist infighting, which often amounted to rehashing historical beef in circles, it felt really good to be involved in something that had so many arms of real world action. That's another important part of why I became a revolutionary. I started reaching out to organizing during a time when I didn't have much agency otherwise, and I didn't feel like I had something that I was engaged in simply because I wanted to be. Even when I was extremely busy with other commitments, it was nourishing to be involved in something that was just for me, because I wanted to be involved and not because some circumstance was forcing me into it. In this day and age, even such a minor move as looking up from the hamster wheel and keeping attention on your own agency is a revolutionary act. I observed for a few years during this time as well, where the more defined anarchist projects had taken them in terms of organizing, discipline, meeting objectives, and unsurprisingly found that most of them had fallen away or become sidetracked due to one reason or another. It seemed a lack of clear cohesive underpinning was not able to sustain the movements over time. While there is a lot of exciting energy, slogans, and aesthetics that come from such types of organizing, the lack of results is patently unsatisfying to me. As I alluded to before, I'm part of the struggle because I don't see any legitimate alternative. You can keep burying your head in the sand and allow your conditions, your community, your society, your planet around you to plummet into degradation and chaos, or you can try to fight back. They will call you a radical and smear you as revolutionary for even the most reformist of ideas anyway. What the theory and indeed application of Marxism in history has taught me is that we are 100%, we 100% need to finish the, do the job and take the overturn of capitalism all the way across the finish line. The social democratic reforms that were extremely hard won by communists and socialists throughout the 
40s and 50s and FDR's New Deal era served to raise the material conditions of the working class yet. Yes, but what's now called the golden age of capitalism by propagandists only displays the impacts of socialist policies and practice, which hemmed in the inherent excesses and contradictions of capitalism, at least within the Western world. This is why I remain a revolutionary, because I don't want others to fall for the false idols again. I don't want us to slip back into complacency if and when we ever win some working class concessions which make life slightly more tolerable for the majority. We have seen and felt how this is not enough. The powers that be have done their best to obscure these historical lessons, to hide the ugly truths of capital, capital's violent and ongoing class warfare, to propagandize the fuck out of you, I'm allowed to say that, into believing things that are directly contradicted by the experience of your senses, like the free market exists and brings fairness and competition. The philosophy of material dialectics has taught me a lot this year. It has taught me, sadly, that I think we are at the end of our rope as a global community of the 99%. There is no other lesson to learn other than the true nature and operation of capital and forming class relations that will prepare us for the fight that's now upon us. In so many ways, it's the same fight that our comrades were waging over 100 years ago, before the world wars interfered with the progressive march of socialist international movements. We are experiencing many of the same class relations, the same contradictions. However, now the crescendo is at a higher frequency. The states, stakes have become higher as the conditions have literally regressed. While the form and operation of our oppression has changed and evolved over the years as technologies have introduced new dynamics and opportunities for manipulation and theft, the function of our exploitation remains the same, to act as the underclass, to be the body, the host for the ever-growing parasite that feeds off our backs. I'm a revolutionary because I have learned that capitalism is inherently irrational in its structural exaltation of greed and selfishness. The logic of capital, ever increasing accumulation, ever increasing exploitation, ever growing profits, ever greater efficiencies and monoliths is simply incompatible with the realities of wide scale human existence. As a species that requires material interaction and development with the world around us in order to survive. Allowing greed to run rampant across every institution of power and consequence in society necessarily means that over time, there will not be enough produced or developed to sustain the majority. But that's not capital's problem. The capital order will continue like a mindless blob monster pillaging and looting everything it encounters and hiding it away out of reach from the masses until we all either starve or start to organize and fight back. The anarchy of the market has governed our trajectories long enough. It's produced nothing but cataclysmic threats or meaningless baubles and pieces of junk clog up our bodies and minds. We have allowed neoclassical fairy tales to distort our understanding of the true dynamics dictating relations all around us, those of class power and consolidation, the accumulation of fictitious capital that has purchased political capital and thus given license to the plundering and loot looting, usurping of real resources that we all need to survive. The capital order has manufactured scarcity through austerity politics, and we are feeling the effects of a real resource drain on the majority working class. Finally, I'm a revolutionary because I understand that material dialectics means that while I can interpret history through the lens of class, power, and resource relations, I recognize that human action, a resulting consequence, is not guaranteed through assuming a passive naturalization of these forces, thinking that naturally the pendulum swings or that the scientific logic of class relations means that socialism is inevitable. So it doesn't matter one way or another what you do as an individual. Quite the opposite, rather. Dialectics inculcates within us the capacity to affect our environment through action, through the very action that is propelled by a cor correct raising of consciousness. We raise class consciousness in order to dispel the myths and propaganda that the capitalist class shoves down our throats 24 seven to realize the massive inherent, if latent power of the working class majority to actually affect their own conditions. If we can but get on the same page about what the real problem is and act accordingly with collective strategy and solidarity. The conditions are ripening now as they deteriorate. People feel the squeeze all around us and reach around in the dark for answers, for explanations, for solutions. I am a revolutionary because I understand the importance of being there ready to receive the discontent and alienation of the working people and directed appropriately up to the ownership class, not wasting effort dragging one another down, 
but to help lead the working class in developing their own consciousness and belief in their own forces, to provide a real chance of taking power when the time is right. This, to me, is the task of a revolutionary. Thanks. Thank you, Flo. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Emily Sears. She's a singer and she teaches music. She helped to organize a union for the TAs at Waterloo University, and she's a member of the Socialist Action Central Committee, resigning in Guelph, Ontario. Welcome, Emily. Hello, comrades. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you all. And I just want to commend Flo for that fantastic presentation. Um, you speak with such eloquence, and I hope I can be even half as eloquent as, as you were. So why I became a revolutionary? Well, <laughs> when I was a child, my parents were often amused and more than occasionally chagrined by my very strong sense of justice. Apparently, this is very common amongst uh, folks with ADHD and autism is our unerring sense of fairness of, but wait a second, hold on a minute. Uh, and uh, we try and at least for myself, uh, then we make it everyone else's problem. I was constantly outraged and indignant about a whole variety of things, uh, sharing cake with my brother and him getting a slightly bigger piece. But also I was outraged seeing hungry people on the streets near my home, um, that there were children around the world who couldn't go to school. And I refused to accept the answers I got for why these things were allowed to persist. My parents will gladly share many stories of my outrageous tantrums as a child when I felt that there were indignities that had not been properly addressed. This kind of mounting sense of injustice only increased uh, during the 2008 financial crisis. I was only 12 at the time, but I knew something big was happening. I watched my father struggle, acting as a single parent at the time, grinding out dead end jobs and hoping we'd be able to hold on to our apartment that we were living in. My nascent instincts for fairness and equity were strained to the limit. The 2010s were, of course, a continuing era of radicalization for many of us. Uh, as Flo mentioned, the 2011 Arab Spring and the Occupy movement galvanized a renewed consciousness in the power of the working class. We are the 99% remains a popular slogan for understanding wealth inequality. Um, I came to socialism via feminist beat. A very formative experience for me was the 2014 incident Gamergate, um, which for those who don't know, it was an um, online media backlash against, uh, against um, target, targeting women in high profile media roles. Um, and it was the nascent beginnings of a rising, rising populist misogynist right wing movement that has spiraled into incels, shooters, the Donald Trump, the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally that we are seeing now culminating in a form of reactionary fascism that is unprecedented in my lifetime. I witnessed this and I was terrified, terrified by the rising tide of people who hated me, who vocally stood against everything that I thought was important. In university, I was very fortunate to connect with several seasoned activists and feminist scholars that put me on a good track of understanding the world and giving language to this nebulous sense of anger and injustice that I had felt since I was a child. Um, one of the people I connected with is a dear friend of mine, a dear comrade based in Montreal, who was one of the organizers of the 2012 Quebec student strike. He was the one who introduced me to revolutionary literature, starting me off with uh, essays by Alexander Kollontai, which to this day remain one of my favorite pieces of literature. The Letters of Rosa Luxemburg, The History of the Paris Commune, The Firebrand Feminism of Bell Hooks, The Treatises of Lenin, and The Discourses of Malcolm X and Franz Fanon. New worlds opened up to me. Our struggles 
were not new. We were part of a rich history of resistance. This was also where I learned that as much as we might like to believe that the arc of history tends to bend towards justice, that is only in retrospect and it is not acknowledging the many hands that have forcefully yanked, shaped, warped, and bent that arc into a more just world. I discovered that I could be part of a legacy of people saying enough and demanding equity and justice rather than hoping that it might come to pass. Still, I was in a small university town and I felt pretty limited in how I would be able to move forward and how to put these ideas into action. I was angry. I had ideas, but I didn't know how to put them into action. This all came to a head in 2018 when I read the IPCC report, the International Panel on Climate Change. This sent me over the edge. Um, and I will say, um, I will just pause for a quick trigger warning. Um, this next part of my presentation talks fairly frankly about suicidal ideation. Reading the IPCC report was a visceral, physical experience. As much as I had been involved previously and as much as I'd felt this kind of lingering sense of anxiety and anger, this was the moment where it came to a head. And I am not ashamed to admit, but I will say I wanted to die. I felt like the world was going to collapse around me, that I was in the vestiges, the last remnants of a once great hall that was bordering on collapse. And I felt like, well, Maybe if I could die and with my death, I could save some people. I could, if I could guarantee the well-being of the world, sacrifice myself to keep maybe a few people safe, it would be worth it. I, I would die in a heartbeat. I would give my life so quickly if I felt that it would help. But what would my death accomplish? And I came to the realization that, well, if I was willing to die for this, what might it mean to live for this? What might it mean to live for the hope of a better world and to give my life, not through death, but through my action and my energy, what might it mean to give my life to the things I believed in? And it was, I think, in that very low point in late 2018 that an ad on social media popped up into my feed saying, Socialist Action, Educational Conference, November in Toronto. I happened to be in Toronto that week, and I thought, well, hey, this seems like something I might be interested in. I was tired of being angry online. I was tired of connecting with people who felt the same way I did, but we all felt paralyzed that we couldn't do anything to action the fears and the terror and the anger that we were all experiencing. And I came to that November educational and I felt like I had come home. Suddenly I found the people who are saying all of the things out loud that I had been thinking for years. And they had a language and a framework and an understanding that allowed them to put those things into action. Far more than just being angry or complaining or saying, you know, tear it all down, it's all rotten and nothing's worth it anyway. They had principles, strategy, a history, and the experience that me and my friends were all desperately lacking. Uh, one second, my apologies. My apologies. 
It is through Socialist Action that I started, again, reading more literature and learning more about the programs of Lenin and Trotsky, and also that encouraged me to get involved in more struggles. I connected with um, Extinction Rebellion and other local environmental groups in my area, bringing a socialist perspective to their actions. In 2019, I got involved in the fight for unionizing the Laurier TAs, and it was through the experience of many seasoned Socialist Action members that I learned the intricacies of working with the unions, of the struggle against the bosses, and how much they would do to prevent you from trying to organize your workplace. I was inspired by the power of the United Front approach, a collaborative and network-oriented idea we're not positioning ourselves as superior, but recognizing the different areas of expertise and power and connection and community that different organizations held. I also appreciated the plurality of focus tied together with a principled orientation. We work in the NDP. We work in the unions. We work with marginalized peoples and advocates for oppressed peoples the world over. We are engaged in solidarity strategies for Venezuela, for Cuba, um, and many more. But it is all tied together with a core underlying principle. We have to build revolutionary sentiment. We have to build a revolutionary party of people who will be ready to bend that arc of history towards the justice we are all desperately craving. This was further exemplified through the actions we took during the 2020 um, COVID crisis, advocating, um, advocating for how to conduct ourselves and how to organize online um, when we were forced to social distance. We also spearheaded several resistance strategies during the 2021 free, so-called freedom convoy and proposed alternatives. Socialist action helped give me a voice. It helped me channel my music into politics, something that as a musician, I have often felt torn in having to present myself as this palatable, neutral figure that audiences and audition panels would appreciate. It gave me back agency. And it helped knowing people would have my back no matter what. Through our actions, through the setting up of our webcasts and the Red Review, we were able to share diverse ideas and interesting stories that weren't covered by the mainstream media and get those out to a more interested audience. These, these cross-solidarity initiatives, promoting different ideas, and connecting with people engaged in all aspects of the struggle has cemented my place among socialist action and cemented my philosophy of revolutionary socialism being the only way forward. It is only through proposing truly radical ideas that any movement happens. The activation energy is desperately needed, and we are the ones who are on the forefront of every movement pushing that boundary and providing resources, intelligence, and strategy that underpins all of our revolutionary and actionable ideas. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is Victor Morgan. He is an LGBTQI activist and is the Socialist Action Atlantic Branch Organizer. Victor resides in the coast of Bays, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Welcome, Victor. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be at this uh, very, very intelligent and eloquent speaking event. I don't know if I will even shine a candle to Emily and Flo, but uh, I will definitely give it my best. So the question is, why revolutionary politics? What made you become a revolutionary? And all you need to do to understand the answer to that question is look around you in the world that surrounds us. Capitalism has seeped into every single corner of our human experience. You cannot walk out your door. You cannot go down the street. You cannot go online. You cannot so much as interact with your friends and family without being confronted with capitalism. 
And I didn't understand that as a child. I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't understand what it was. I would leave my parents' house to walk down the road and I would be surrounded by dilapidated houses, uh, road work that was falling apart, bridges that were not safe to cross, infrastructure that was just being left to die. And one of the reasons for that is because I come from a town that was specifically built to service three gun battery bunkers um, in and around the Botwood area during the Second World War. So that community was built specifically to service the military industrial complex. Now it's a town of about 140 people. But the dangers of leaving capitalism where it lay were all around you. You could see people who couldn't afford to live, people who couldn't afford medications, people who couldn't afford their way into the inner city to receive care that they desperately needed. There were many times when it just wasn't safe to drive up over the road in your vehicle because you would you would destroy it. You'd beat it to pieces and it wouldn't be worth driving after that. And we live in a, in a community that has a government road. It should have been taken care of. And that was something that I realized at a young age, things that should have been being done weren't. There were things that needed to be done that weren't. Things that all they required was a little bit of kindness, a little bit of compassion and the will to do it. And people's lives would be better. It wouldn't take a great deal of manpower to move the earth. There were small things that could have been done that could have fixed things that we just neglected to do as, as a government and as a society. And even as a child, you always saw the argument of red versus blue. We're gonna vote for the liberals. We're gonna vote for the uh, conservatives. We're gonna go uh, one way or the other. And you flip flop back and forth for decades and nothing changes. The, the old saying about insanity is insanity is trying something over and over and over again, expecting a different result. And that's what we as a country have been doing. We have been trying liberals and trying conservatives over and over, expecting a different outcome than what we have gotten decades in a row. So I knew that there was something wrong. You could see it, but I didn't understand the solution to it. I just knew if we were kinder, if we put more effort into loving each other, we could make a better world. So I didn't really understand the politics. I didn't really understand um, the, the idea of politics. It was, it was a word I knew, but it wasn't something I understood. So there came a point when there was an election and I didn't understand how that worked. I didn't understand how voting worked or who could vote, who had the right to vote, who didn't. Um, but it was an ad that was put out by the NDP during the uh, election and the campaign for Jack Layton. And he said a lot of stuff in the ad that I really resonated to. It made sense to me to be kinder, to do more for each other, to, to fix the inequalities that we can fix. It's not that we can't. We have the ability to do it. All we need to do is raise our hands and fix it. So that really spoke to me, the fact that someone would stand there and talk about how to make a better world and how to fix what was broken. And I would hear people in the community around me saying, well, we're not going to vote for the NDP. They're running a socialist. They're running socialists. We're not going to vote for the NDP. And I didn't understand what that meant. So I did everything I could. I found every book I could in school that mentioned socialism and, and talked about it. Uh, not so much to understand, to understand, you know, the, the people in history who have fought for it and, and the struggle, but to understand the fundamentals, the things that socialism meant. And socialism is, is just one word that means compassion. It means caring about each other. It means fixing the things we can fix. It means creating a government which is formed to take care of the country to take care of its people, to make sure that we have what we need and nobody takes advantage of the system and, and, and sucks out all of the wealth or all of the, the necessary you know, medical care, whatever it is. No one consolidates the necessary things to keep our lives going. And I didn't understand why people would vote against that. If you have someone standing in front of you and they're telling you, we can have a better world, this is how we do it. This is the way that we can do it. 
And, you know, looking back on it, my politics are a lot further left than Jack Layton's were at the time. So I have evolved past where my political awakening was because there were things I realized like, no, you should have went further. You should have said this. You should have done this. But at that time, it didn't make sense to me how people could vote against something that it just sounded like perpetual crisps. Everybody has enough. Everybody has food. Everybody has a house. Everybody has clothes. Everybody can wash. Everybody can get from point A to point B without having to go and buy an expensive vehicle. And the community and the government are there to take care of you. I didn't understand why people couldn't vote for that or didn't want to vote for that. And overseeing the debates that happened between Jack Layton uh, and his opponents and seeing how the media dealt with that, then it made sense why people wouldn't vote for socialism. It was because we've been propagandized for decades against it. Socialism to the main public and, and the greater body of the country doesn't mean taking care of each other. It doesn't mean making sure that everybody has enough. Because of the propagandization that we have went through, it means bread lines which is so abstract and far from reality that it, it would never even be considered if it was a legitimate conversation. It means countries that have fallen apart. Uh, and that's what they attribute it to, even though pretty much every country that has had socialism as um, their, their main form of governing, if they did collapse, it was because of other countries that went to war with them and systematically dismantled their their countries so it's not the fault of socialism it's the fault of the people shooting people in the back that caused it but that's what everyone believed because of the propagandization socialism was synonymous with people suffering it was synonymous with starvation it was synonymous with the the greater suffering of an entire nation not just it's not a good way to govern but it will kill your country if you go with socialism and that's just not part of the fundamentals of socialism. It has nothing to do with it. And that's what I realized looking into this as a young person trying to figure out where their, their feet kind of landed on the ground in their own politics, is that if our fundamentals are going to be so intrinsic to kindness and compassion and necessity and making sure everybody has enough and nobody's table is, is without food, how is it possible that that can be our fundamentals, but in practice, uh, it could fail so horribly? And it, it very much woke me up to the realization that much of what we're told about the world is just not true. The media forces narratives down our throat all the time. They spin tales that they try to make us believe. And it's very difficult sometimes to find your way through all of that. So you can imagine as someone you know, 14, 15 years old, who has no knowledge of politics at all, trying to understand that the media is lying to you and they're trying to force a narrative and you're supposed to believe the news. You're supposed to believe your government. That's what I grew up believing as a child. Uh, and then all within like a year or two, all of that dissolved. And, and it, it, it was instead of you can trust the government, they're going to be there for you. It was I know who owns the government now, and it's not us. So I joined up with the NDP as quickly as I could after um, I got to, I think it was 14 was the age you needed to be to register here back then. Um, and I wasn't old enough to vote, but I was old enough to talk. So I went to my parents and my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles, and I was like, you need to vote NDP. And they were like, why would we do that? Why would we ever do that? And I would sit with them and explain it to them. And when Jack Layton was campaigning was the only time that my grandmother ever hung an NDP banner from her front bridge for all the world to see, um, who has voted like conservative or liberal for all of her life, depending on, on who she knows that got into uh, campaigning at the time, because they have very personal connections to a lot of the uh, politicians in our area. But she hung an NDP flag and put up an NDP sign in her front garden that year for his campaign. And there was a lot of things that she realized, I think, during that time uh, that I think probably changed her life a great deal from, from where it was to where it is now. 
but it was a, a great time of understanding for me, uh, awakening for me. And it was, it, it also, I'm sure a lot of younger comrades and older comrades can relate to this. It caused a lot of hatred in me for the way that our systems worked, for the way that our world worked, because it seemed so negligent and so careless that we have the power to fix these things, but we choose not to. It's not that we can't. We can, and we have in the past. There are systems that we have created in other countries that work better, but we're not using them, not because it's hard, not because it's impossible, because, but because we just don't want to. Or worse than that, because it isn't profitable. If you cannot make money from medical care, then you don't provide medical care. If you cannot make money from selling people food, then you don't create or grow food. That's how capitalism works. It creates necessity where there is none, and it takes advantage of the necessity that exists to profit from it. So I realized very quickly at a young age that both the liberal and conservative parties are no different. They might have different social politics. One party might not appreciate the fact that gays uh, have the audacity to breathe, but the other party might. However, either one, liberal or conservative, you're still going to have a rough life as a person who lives in this country if you are not wealthy. You are going to be downtrodden. You are going to find it very difficult to exist. And that's what I saw as a child was people putting their faith and belief behind two parties that just could not be bothered to care. But they made them believe that they did. So I had, I had a lot of confusion at a young age. And growing into revolutionary politics, I was a revolutionary before I realized what politics was. I wanted the system to change, but I didn't know how to change it. I knew that it needed to change, but there was no avenue that I could walk down to change it. So I understood that the world was broken and I understood that it doesn't have to be. So it caused a great deal of frustration. And uh, as comrade Emily mentioned, the climate report that came out, I had many of the same feelings that she did because of seeing the way that our politics has gone, the way that the NDP has gone, because it's, it's not what it used to be. Um, that's very clear for anybody in the, in the main body of the NDP. But reading that climate report, it, it really lit a fire in my heart that pushed me to want better from the NDP, to expect better from the NDP. And what came out after that climate report was more 2050 targets, more oil subsidies, more we'll get to it when we get to it. When, as Flo stated in, in her uh, lovely speech, that's just not possible. That's not the case. We need to do something now. We can't wait. There is no more waiting we have left to do. It's over. The time when we could have averted disaster is gone. Now we have to try and avert the worst parts of the disaster. So we're going to have massive ecological disaster either way at this point, because that's the way our leaders have chosen to go. And if that doesn't push you to revolutionary politics, I don't know what will. Seeing our world, our home, our communities be slowly destroyed by capitalism, that should spur anybody to revolutionary politics. Because if you are in a place in this country where you have had your homes burned to the ground in the middle of a season where wildfires are not supposed to be common, look at uh, Nova Scotia right now, horrible, horrible wildfires caused by um, actions that should not have been taken, mind you, but it's something that's happened all across this country. So if you watch your community be burned to the ground and then the government gets there and they say, we're going to give $30 billion to the oil companies. How does that not push you to revolutionary politics? If, if you have been so grievously wounded by climate change, but then the people who are supposed to be protecting you say, we're just going to put more money behind it. We're going to put more money in the giant money pit that we've created that is the oil and gas industry, and we're just going to light it on fire. And no matter how many communities burn, we're still breaking in billions, so it's fine. So capitalism has an inherent 
disconcern for human life. We saw that come to a very clear and stark uh, showing during the pandemic. Many, many places in the world created lockdowns. They created restrictions, they created mandates to protect the populace. The you know, Northern European countries are a great example of this. They put in great effort to keep people safe. Mask mandates, vaccination mandates, lockdowns when they were needed. They cared about keeping people safe. But here in North America, we saw even here in Newfoundland, dozens of our businesses here signing petitions to have our government remove the mandates partway through the worst stages of the pandemic. They wanted them gone. They didn't care about who lived and who died. They wanted the mandates removed because their flow of cash was slowed. They didn't care how many families would go without grandparents, how many parents would have to bury their children. It didn't matter. They needed the money. So above all else, that's what was important to them. And those examples don't just exist during the pandemic. We saw them clearly during the pandemic, but that isn't just where they are. You look around you everywhere in the world and you will see how deep the poison of capitalism have seeped into our veins as a society. Every grocery store in the world throws out tons of food a month because it has gone out of date. And rather than donate it, they decide that it's going to the dump. It's going to be thrown out. It's going to be gotten rid of. Food that could feed hungry people. So that's just an example of we have the power to fix it, but we're choosing not to because of capitalism. It's the reason we're not doing it. We have the ability as a society to become so much better, to do so much better. But because of capitalism, we can't. It's like, it's like a debilitating disease. It's like an abusive relationship. It holds you back physically and mentally from the things that we as a species could accomplish. We can make a better world. We can colonize the stars. We can fix our climate. We can eradicate diseases. We can do all of those things. But capitalism requires that we do it at an extreme profit or we don't do it at all. So we don't feed the hungry unless it's profitable. We don't cure the sick unless it's possible, unless it's profitable, sorry. We create ample amounts of supply that we will never use simply because we need to sell a little bit of it. The fashion industry is an extreme example of this where every season they come out with a new line of wonderful, colorful clothes. And last seasons all goes away. It doesn't just disappear. It's not repurposed, it's thrown away. Clothes that could be given to homeless, clothes that could be given to people who require it in different parts of the world. But we don't do that because it's not profitable. Right now in my province of Newfoundland, we have a housing crisis that is horrific. We have thousands of people across this province who have nowhere to live. Even here in Gander, where I live, we have been putting people who are houseless in hotel rooms because there's nowhere else for them to go. We don't have shelters. We don't have a place for these people to live. So we put them in hotel rooms rather than do what we have the power to do, which is build very cost effective homes, build high density population uh, uh, buildings in areas that we can do it. We just choose not to. People have been trying for years, but we don't because why would we? It's not profitable. And if the human race is going to measure itself and hold itself back, by doing only what is profitable, then our mark on the history of this planet will be sad and it will be much lesser than it could ever have been. And that's an extremely depressing thought. Um, Comrade mentioned earlier that it can really bring feelings of just not wanting to live in the world because of the horrors that we face, because of the fact that we're choosing not to fix them, because of the fact that Watching it happen is like seeing someone jump from a building while there are 30 people behind them that could have at some point grabbed them, but they chose not to. That's what capitalism is. It's choosing not to for the sake of money, for the sake of profit. So 
it, it really caused me to understand that something has to be done. Something new has to be done. And I was approached a few years ago by a member of Socialist Action. Out of the blue, pretty much. I was commenting on an NDP post on uh, Twitter, I believe it was. And um, I was contacted by a person who said, hey, Socialist Action is a thing that exists. We work within the NDP to push them further to the left. We work within the NDP to correct some of their shortcomings. And the second I read that message, I said, where do I sign up? Where do I go to join? Send me the link. Tell me who to talk to. I want to be part of that. And within a couple of days, I was put in contact with um, our wonderful co-chair, Barry Weisletter, and I was in. My, my foot wasn't so much in the door as Barry had grabbed it and pulled me in through. And it was the best decision politically I've ever made in my life because it surrounded me with people who understood and believed what I believed, that we could do better. And what I've seen from socialist action, which makes me really believe that we can, is anytime the NDP doesn't say the right thing, or they go too far to the right, which is where they like to live lately, uh, socialist action is there to, to come out and say, no, this is not the right thing you should be doing. This is where you should be. We saw it with the uh, debate over the minimum wage during our um, our convention for the NDP. They said, we want to do $15 an hour. Okay, that's extremely low and not going to change anybody's life. But social section members got up and said, no, we need $20 an hour. That needs to be the minimum wage. This is where our new standard should be. We've been fighting for 15 for 15 years. It's not good enough anymore. So... The fact that we have the willpower to do it, and we have been shown the avenues to create positive change through the NDP, really makes me seconds. believe that it can be better. So not only was socialist action a good political step for me, but socialist action has actually made my mental health so much better because it showed me that there is a bridge to the other side. And all you have to do is get some people and walk across. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Very, very inspiring speeches from all. I'm so glad that you're my comrades. Okay, so now we're going to open up the, the room for um, questions and answers. And, and each person asking a question will get up to three minutes. And the person answering uh, uh, the, the question, which can be one of you on the panel, two of you, all three of you, it's up to you guys. Uh, we'll get three minutes as well. We'll get to as many questions as we can. I have some spotters that will uh, watch the screen. If I miss somebody's hand, that goes up. So you can actually put your uh, computer hand up or just raise your hand for a question. So the floor is now open. Go ahead. Okay. Am I missing something here? I don't see. I don't see any hands up. Ellen raised her All right, hand. Barry. Go, go ahead, Barry. Okay. Sorry, Ellen. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I'll go ahead if you don't mind first. because Yes, go ahead. In common about each of you in your talk, I think they were very well structured, and there's a general pattern of your talk, which is things start at the personal level with the realization of injustices in the world in your own life and oppression in your own life. Then you find the connections to others in the community who are going through similar experiences and you're awakened to the position of others, some of whom may be living under worse circumstances than yourself. And then there's a move to the political structure. Who, 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 where do you reach out? Who are the people doing something about it? In Victor's case, it was the NDP. In Flo's case, it was other left groups until you find someone who sort of um, uh, has answers, can answer some of your questions and start to galvanize and organize you into action about it. So my question is at what point, um, where, where would we as a revolutionary party, um, where are we best situated to reach you at the earlier stages when you're going through the personal injustices and then linking it to people in the community? Um, where is it that we could reach you best? Uh, it'd probably be different maybe for each one of you, but that's my question. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ellen. Okay, so we will first go to Emily, then Victor, and then Flo, if you wish to speak to this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think an, another common thread for all of us is that socialist action found us at the right time. Like I had been getting increasingly frustrated and I was tired of just being angry and impotent online. And I needed an outlet. I needed to find a place to action the things I was feeling and socialist action happened to appear in my life at the right moment. Um, I think what we're doing already is, is putting us out there. Um, and you know we're we're reaching a lot of people we have a lot of new recruits some people come into socialist action maybe before they're ready or when it's it's not the right time for them um as as much as we wish that that it was the perfect time for them to be part of it sometimes people just aren't ready um i think the common thread for for all three of us today was socialist action came into our lives at a time when we were ready and maybe the thing to do is continue to put ourselves out there, wear the shirts and the, bring the flags to the marches, put up the posters, continue to do our work on, on social media and making webcasts and podcasts, um, continue to get involved in all of the movements. And as I say, continuing to put ourselves out there in all of the many, many ways that we do. And when people are ready, they'll find us. There are lots of people who've joined Socialist Action who've known, you know, about us or heard of us for a while, and then they decide to join. Um, so I think the the cross pollination of different activist groups is very powerful. And as I say, putting ourselves out there and making ourselves a beacon for those who, as, as Flo so beautifully put it. The, the wandering souls on the bird app, um, a great turn of phrase uh, of many in your speech, putting ourselves out there so that people can find us, that people know where we are when they are ready. And then we just help get everyone else ready when the time comes. Okay, thank you, Emily. Victor, you want to answer that question? Yeah, I would like to give a short answer. Um, I, I'm going to expand, I think, on uh, a little bit of what Comrade Emily said. Um, that was where I was found, was on social media, uh, through a debate that I was having online over something that was posted by the NDP. Um, and that's where a lot of young people coagulate, is in online spaces, especially, you know, because of the pandemic. Uh, there were a lot of groups that didn't gather anymore, a lot of social spaces that didn't host people anymore. So online was a really good place for me to go to talk to people who believed in the same thing that I believed in. So if, if you really want to catch people when they are in a good position to be talked to and to be um, brought in as a comrade, there are a lot of online spaces and discussions where many people are ready right there. You just need to show up and say, hey, I'm part of this organization. I think you should be part of this organization. Come and hang out and hold hands with me. So um, I, I think, yeah, exactly, Emily. We, we need to be ready with the net to catch them when they're ready to jump because a lot of people are ready to go. They're ready for revolutionary politics, but they don't know where to look because the three parties that we have, yes, the NDP is further to the left than the other two, but they have come with a lot of their own issues in the past 10 years. So some people are looking at them and say, well, why would you vote for them? Why would you go register with them when they're just orange liberals? but they have the power to be a lot more. And it's because of organizations like Socialist Action that the NDP has so much potential, so much that we can do. It's because of groups like us that young people have a place to look for hope and for a little bit of light in the future. Okay, Flo, you wish to answer this question? Well, I don't have much to add. I think they hit the nail on the head there um, because yeah everyone kind of goes through their own process um, and when they're ready um, obviously being having an online presence is important and something that plays on my mind sometimes but uh, but it's also really important not to just only act in that sphere I think and that's definitely one of the the um, 
you know, uh, things that's like best, I think, about socialist action, especially relative to the other revolutionary parties out there. Um, so it's it's an interplay, a dialectic, if you want to put it that way. Um, but yeah, if we can be out there and ready to catch folks so they know what we're up to, then it'll just be easier. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the speaking list I have so far right now is Barry and, and I have Victor. I guess he wants to ask a question as well. And I have a question that I will read out from Chris and Julius. So that's the lineup so far. So go ahead. Barry. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the presenters who did such an inspiring job. So articulate. Well, comrades and friends, this is Pride Month. But the Toronto District School Board, the Toronto Catholic District School Board decided that it will not display the rainbow flag. LGBTQI people are the butt of sick jokes and physical threats, including by a Toronto Blue Jays pitcher. Women's right to choose abortion is under attack in the US and in Canada too. In Canada, it often takes the form of a lack of therapeutic medical services available in provinces like PEI and New Brunswick. Young people feel this animus and neglect most sharply. What should socialists do to address this malady? Does championing this, these causes in major working class organizations play an important role? And why does it take socialists to lead this process forward? Okay, all right. So uh, I'm going to take one more question and then uh, panel, keep in mind, you'll have two questions to answer. Victor, you have a question? I do, my question is specifically geared uh, towards flow. Um, because I, I don't really know what Emily plans for her future. Uh, it might it might include her too, but uh, specifically for Flo, I, I want to get more um, more of your knowledge and your feelings and your thoughts on on what it's like bringing a child into the world, given the situations that we're living in and the anxieties that that bring. And I I kind of the question is pretty much just what are you what are your fears and what are your hopes for the future that knowing that your child has to walk down that path. Okay, so I'm going to go to Flo first and then Emily and then Victor to answer the question that Barry asked. Okay, so Flo, you have both questions. You can answer them how you wish. Okay. Um, well, and you, and you, have four, you have four minutes for two questions. Okay. Um, just because, yeah, it's definitely top of mind. Um, you know, it's like, it's funny. It's just, I don't know about funny, maybe it's sad, but yeah, I didn't really like plan things like this, you know, it's kind of like had some kids and then a few couple years later, it was like, oh shit, like things were really bad, you know, um, but um, it's odd. I've had it a lot, like some philosophical reframing, I guess, of things I've noticed out over the last few years, just like kind of like coming to terms with where we might be headed, you know, or where it looks like we're headed as a planet and a society. And on the one hand, you have to just kind of try to balance um, the long range, big picture social view with also just trying to like maintain some standards of living and just basic comfort within your own kind of immediate experience, right? Because at the end of the day, okay, this might start getting into like a bit of a, you know, morbid or a existential philosophy territory. But, you know, at the end of the day, everyone, nobody gets out of this world alive, right? Like we're born, we have life experience, we all die. Um, so the, you know, so on, on the one hand, it's like, don't be overly, preoccupied with you know the future of the planet because you really only kind of have control over your immediate environment or at least what you experience you know as suffering or not is going to be determined by your more like your actual experience of life so 
you know, the, I think that gives you some sort of comfort where it's like, okay, even if the, you know, world is going down, not a very good path and, and there is going to be lots of suffering. I am hopeful that we can take some kind of precautions or, you know, do some things to just try and safeguard like a decently comfortable corner of the world uh, for my kids and my community and people. And, and like, that's what I can do for them. Um, and then I'll, you know, at the same time though, I am going to be fighting for those bigger picture, uh, more systemic and longer term, more structural changes that I think are needed so that we can eventually get out of this pattern you know i think that would be in this case the best case scenario of like i do think things are going to get worse before they get better but if they are going to get better it'll be because of the work of you know committed revolutionaries um and not just people who are only focused on their immediate environment and their you know experience of um life um so, yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but those are the, the thoughts that come up. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Emily, the two questions, Barry's and, and Victor's. Yeah, so I'll address Barry's first. Um, queer people are, um, I think, yeah, queer folks um, and sex workers, um, and often there's an overlap in those communities, um, are often the, the canaries in the coal mine of fascism. Um, when queer and trans people's rights are under attack, um, when we are targeted, um, it is a sign of state repression and state control, and a sign that um, they fear losing control over the populace. Um, again, because my, my main girl, Alexandra Kollontai, um, has written uh, several brilliant pieces about the nature of romance and relationships and the way that capitalist alienation forces us into um, romantic partnerships where, uh, to, the, to the detriment of community. Um, so it, it says that the only relationship you should have is one with reproductive capacity. Um, and we don't have to look far to see how alienated and fractured people have become. How many people do you know who have like, you know, very few close friends and their partner is suddenly their emotional be all and end all, um, especially for men. Um, but it cannot be overstated. Um, and you know, and that, that clear division of gender roles, that clear division of like, here's the person you should prioritize above all else, um, you know, go to work, come home to your wife, your wife rears the children. That narrative is integral to the maintenance of the capitalist system. Um, and so it's no wonder that capitalism struggles so much with queerness. Um, because if we say, well, but what if, what if those social roles don't serve me? Uh, what if I don't want to play the social, what, what if I don't want to follow the script that society has set for me? That's dangerous. That is dangerous to the capitalist state. Um, and if we can buck the role of gender, if we can buck the role of sexuality, that, um, cis heteronormative society teaches us if we can buck those things what else can we buck what else can we say actually this doesn't serve me at all and maybe we should do something different um there's also the power of queer community and queer organizing that forces us because so many of us are forced out of our homes out of our communities um we create our own networks found family um queer friendships queer relationships um, that go beyond monogamy, that go beyond this very cis heteronormative narrative of your romantic partner is your be all and end all, and you do not have a community external to that, that fractured, isolated alienation. 
queerness demands community. Queerness is something that we live in relationship. And so it is, it is an incredible threat to anyone who has an investment in the status quo and anyone who is invested in people not thinking freely and thinking for themselves and independently. So I think that's a large part of the pushback we see is it's a loss of control. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that our capacity as queer people to push that boundary and to say, imagine other possibilities beyond what you've been told. That's so radical. That's so radical. That's so revolutionary. And it lays the seed of everything else. The so queer liberation is inherently tied up with social revolution and the liberation of all peoples because it is the abolition of coercive state control over our lives and who we are and who we get to be. Um, I will very quickly respond to Victor's comment uh, or question just because uh, while I don't have children myself, it is something that as a, as a woman in her late 20s, it's something I think about a lot. Um, I since since 2018, I have thought long and hard about whether or not I'm going to have children and what that would mean. Um, right now, I am my partner and I are in no way, shape or form ready to have children um, in our just where we are in our lives, in our careers and financially. Um, having a kid would be a really big problem for us. Um, but I think like, I, as I say, I'm open to the possibility because I, I do believe in our future. I do believe in our capacity to make a better world for our children. And I've been very, very inspired by um, several Indigenous organizers who talk about the, um, the critical nature of thinking seven generations back and seven generations ahead. That kind of forethought, that kind of prioritization of the world to come and thinking that, you know, our, our, the world we have is just on loan from our children. It's so important to me. And I think I would have a lot to teach a child. And I think any kid of mine would be pretty freaking cool. Um, so um, as I say, it's a possibility I'm open to, but it is not one that I'm ready for right now. And maybe, you know, my answer changes day to day. And I think it's something that... 30 seconds. Every, yeah, uh, just to wrap up, I think that's a question that pretty much everyone in our generation is really grappling with right now. And it's, it's interesting to see the answers that people have. And I have so much respect for all new parents who are radicals in the movement. You're awesome. Okay. Victor, you want to answer Barry's question? Yeah, I do. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to make the comment that uh, I think uh, having the world on loan from our children is one of the most beautifully accurate things I've ever heard in my life. I've never heard it before. So thank you, Emily, for giving me that little gem. Um, I always heard uh, we need to take better care of the planet so we have something to leave for Betty White when we're all dead. So that was I, I heard that for years and I love that. Um, but yeah, I want to specifically answer a part of Barry's question, which was the end of it, that said, why radical socialism? Why is that the answer? And really, there are a thousand reasons as to why it's the answer. But there are no reasons why it's not. Everything else we've been doing for the last few centuries has not been going well. It has been uh, nothing but a struggle consistently and constantly against uh the merchant class who has taken over all of our resources and all of our society. So if we're going to keep trying the same thing over and over again, we need to keep being prepared for the same results over and over again. So radical socialism is not only something we should be heavily considering, it is a door out of the abusive relationship we have with capitalism. And sometimes you just need to take the step to leave. That, that's what you have to do. People that I know and myself have been in situations that were abusive and manipulative and, and wholly toxic to one side, that were parasitic, you just need to go. 
you need to make the decision to walk out through the door. And that's what we as a society have to do. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. The transition is going to require a lot of manpower, a lot of energy, a lot of hope and courage to do it. But we can and we should do it. And as Flo and Emily stated, the future is the most important thing to the generations we're bringing into the world. Not even if, if we decide we're not going to have children, because I know that there was a massive shift in my own perception when my cousin had his daughter and I saw her for the first time. My grandfather was holding her in his arms, a little tiny baby, uh, just a, a little miniature human. And I saw in his eyes the most purest form of love for another human that could ever possibly be in existence. And that really made me believe, no, like this, this nihilism and, and knowing that self-destruction is on the way, regardless of what the truth is, we need to fight to the bitter end for people like that. We can't let go until we can't hold it anymore. Like we have to keep going no matter what, no question. The fight is not over until it's over. Okay, thank you, Victor. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the speakers list and I have a question from Chris and Julius and I think Flo has got her hand up for a question as well. So her and Kiri. So the first question I will read and then I will bring Julius on to ask his question. And this question is from Chris Wanamaker. He said, you all have alluded to the environmental crisis. Do you think it would be a good idea to change the name of socialist action to echo socialist action? That's question number one. And now I will go to Julius. Julius? Uh, just a second, Elizabeth. I'm on, I have my hand up too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, Jul, and then I'm going to add you then after, after Julius. Sorry, Gary. Okay, so Julius? But Thanks, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you for the fantastic presentations. They're very, very inspiring, and I always love to hear the stories of how people join the movement and join the party. So it's it's really great. Um, so thank you for for the, your very honest and personal presentations. Um, we all join the movement from different places, and um, yeah, no, it's it's great. If someone put a compilation of a book together about how comrades join the movement, I would definitely buy it. I just find it really interesting. Um, so, and thank you for talking about kids and bringing kids into the world uh, that's falling apart and how you've dealt with it. Um, I'm not going to really add anything onto it because pretty much most of my concerns have been expressed by by the folks who gave uh, presentations today so thank you very much for that as well i guess some um, some so some of you have been members for different amounts of time and and while um you know i appreciate hearing you know how joining sa has um, made you um better deal with the economic and you know capitalist crisis that we're dealing with in terms of trying to focus on it and challenge it in a, in a constructive way. I'm wondering if uh, you can elaborate on any other uh, skills or things that you've learned um, while, from your experience uh, as being a member of Socialist Action. I know, Emily, you alluded to it a little bit with the, the work that you do uh, singing, uh, but I'd like to hear from others as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to Victor, then to Flo and Emily for these two questions. Victor? Uh, yeah, so first I'm going to answer Chris's question. Uh, why don't we change the name to Eco-Socialist Action? Uh, and I think they're, like, to me, the environment and climate change is definitely the most pressing and important issue. If, if you just push aside the danger of nuclear Armageddon at the moment, you just you push that one to the side for one second. Um, it's definitely the biggest thing in my mind. However, uh, that's not the only thing social sections fighting for. It's a huge part, but there is a long list of things of inactions and injustices and an inequality that we are fighting for. And I think as socialist action, we encompass the greatest amount of prospective change that I've ever seen in a group like this. There, we, we don't want to fix one issue. 
We don't want to fix two issues. We want at minimum a better world. That that's our goalpost. That's where we're starting. Things need to be better. And it's not just one or two things. We're not just fighting for the LGBTQIA plus community. We're not just fighting for the environment. We're not just fighting for uh, a better economy. We're not just fighting for our elders. We're fighting for everybody who is oppressed by the billionaire class who have stamped us down for centuries. So I love the name eco-socialist action, but I think just keeping it at a base of socialist action is the truest form of who we are because we're, we're warriors on every front for everybody who needs defending. And to the second question, um, what skills have I gained through my work with socialist action and my uh, political life in general? One of the things that I really, really uh, am proud of is the fact that I'm very difficult to manipulate at this point. After seeing all the media, all the propaganda, after dealing with all of it, I can see through bullshit really, really easily. Um, so it, it, I'm a very difficult person to lie to, and I'm a very difficult person to manipulate and force to do things I don't want. Um, Comrade Emily mentioned in her, her original speech that uh, people who have ADHD uh, and, and you know, certain other things can very quickly see, hey, no, this is, there's something wrong here. That we need to, this, this isn't right. We need to do something to fix it. Um, because you can see in a way that isn't quite the norm. You, you can look at a situation in a way that isn't quite what everyone else is looking at. And I did that for all of my life. But anytime anyone was like, well, no, this is the way it has to be. I'm like, okay, okay if that's the way it has to be. Never again. That I've lived my life in a total mindset of, no, it can be better and we should be making it better. And I, I have not given ground on anything. Like one of my friends, every time we talk about something, he's like, why are you so militant on, on certain things? And my answer is always, because you have to be. If you're going to give ground, people are going to take it. it it's, it's like if, if you want the moon, shoot for the stars. Uh, I want the stars. That's where we're going. That's what we're going to get. And if we're, we don't get to the stars today, we're going to get there tomorrow. And that's the mindset we should we should be moving forward with. OK, thank you, Flo. OK, well, I had my hand up earlier just because um, I did kind of want to comment quickly on Barry's questions. I realized I didn't before. I have okay, like so you can do that now if you wish. I'll give you an extra minute just for you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, you know, I've just, I've been hearing more reductionist, like biologically reductionist, I would say, arguments coming out of like, you know, the transphobe community and stuff. And uh, I heard one the other day, I think it was on, I don't know, breaking points or something, but um, they are becoming quite militant too. And just so like, I'm not sure if I can fully articulate this, but I, I want to like flush it out because the ideas are percolating uh, in, at some point in the near future. But there's just something like wrong with that analysis. And I think it's the same thing that I have trouble with, like when uh, the black and white thinking uh, and like a kind of like a scientism or like a like a sort of uncritical application of, you know, a re reductive type of objectivism um and i actually think that really runs counter to what i'm kind of understanding is the philosophy of material dialectics which really actually tends to problematize binaries in at least in my experience because there really is like an interplay between um a few different things and and i think that when it comes to gender identity there's like definitely an argument to be made there on like a philosophical basis about dialectical materialism which is like why viewing the the gender binary so sort of like arbitrarily um and in that way doesn't really fit because it someone's you know sort of identity and how they feel um on the inside very much has a you know a dialectical relationship with how they present on the outside which really problematizes the idea that there's like a one you know at at what point um does just the embodiment matching the inherent idea on the inside like that that would be a man or a woman you know like there's 
there's just a whole philosophical issue going through there where you know i heard this person talking like oh uh, uh i can't deny their inherent reality and it's like what like first of all you would only be saying that if uh, you know if this person didn't wasn't passing to you right because if someone's passing and you don't um you know recognize what's going on you know under their clothes or whatever then they're essentially like whatever gender it is that you perceive them to be you know so there's there's a lot of areas to to problematize that whole discourse i think on a marxist uh, basis but i'll continue to to think about that um what were the other questions oh uh eco socialism um i i mean i like eco socialism but i i agree kind of with what uh, victor was saying that it is one it's one existential threat amongst uh, many it's like take your pick you know we got nuclear armageddon got this whole pandemic thing now they're like oh wait for the next pandemic and it seems that that may have been <laughs> propelled by you know man uh human technology and and all that um and then of course now we have ai coming up and everyone's worried about that so and i think sometimes um that just the the messaging or that term has maybe been a bit co-opted um by environmentalists and the the um underpinning of everything you know like the environmental crisis is a consequence and a system or a symptom of the the disease which is capitalism you know um if we had a democratic type of economy we'd be able to we will we would have been able to make different choices a long time ago with what kinds of materials and what kinds of uh you know extraction uh products and processes we use but we've been stuck in you know entrenched in the same uh same system, same procedures, same industries, because it's costly to transition. And, you know, in this day and age, nobody, capitalists don't want to invest. They're not investors. They don't invest in anything. They just extract and exploit, you know? So um, I think that grounding it in uh, socialism and really just focusing on the fact that capitalism is the root cause of the ecological crisis is is important um, if we really want to have an environmental movement that is sustainable on a mass scale that we need to see the type of change that we want as well because without the the sort of marxist or you know socialist basis and theory of change i just feel like it all kinds of ends up floundering a little bit um, because they're either not committed enough to a just transition and to the working class and to realizing that, you know, if you want mass mobilization behind this, you're not going to be able to, to dismiss or hand wave away the concerns of, you know, millions of resource workers and stuff like that, or, or you know, over, can't just leapfrog over the union leadership, but we're going to have to address it, you know, head on and that kind of thing. Um, and then the last question, what skills? Kind of a, also in line with what Victor was saying, um, I think, I mean, aside from taking notes and getting marginally better at chairing and learning Robert's rules and stuff like that, um, I think just ha kind of gaining the confidence to be able to articulate, uh, you know, positions and statements and theories that I know are going to get a lot of pushback from people. Um, and just feeling like more okay with a general theme in my life, which is just like feeling like a bit of an outsider, you know, but like not having 30 so seconds. much shame about that and just kind of understanding that, yeah, I'm going to be on the outside of, you know, the mainstream more than likely, or I'm going to be getting pushback, but but that doesn't mean that I'm wrong, you know, <laughs> if anything, it is the mainstream that's wrong. Um, and, and, you know, that's where the solidarity and stuff like that is really important too, because, you know, you got people in, in your corner. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of giving me the confidence to know that even if I'm swimming upstream, that doesn't mean that 
you know, my ideas are wrong. In fact, I have a good theoretical basis for knowing why they're right. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Flo. Okay, Emily, three minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, on the question of should we be eco-socialist action? I mean, I think, I think we already do that in a lot of our principles. Like we are in a continued allyship with a lot of environmental movements. We are in direct communication with a lot of environmental groups and we show the hell up. Um, I wouldn't say we need to change our name, but you know, I think, I think our actions, like we put our money where our mouth is. Um, and I don't know if we need a name change to reflect that, but, but I like the, I like the sentiment. Um, but genuinely, I think if any so-called left, like purportedly left-wing organization or leftist organization is not like very concerned with, um, the environmental movement and is not actively involved in the struggle against climate crisis, that organization is definitionally a failure because it is not addressing the critical crisis of our generation. Um, so, so that's my thought there. Um, to Julia's question of what have you learned in essay? So much, so much. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, from uh, just like how to organize, like how to talk to people about ideas, how to how to engage people in conversations. Um, like the, the help that I got from people when I was doing the union stuff and just like letting me know about like, oh, here's, you know, PSAC versus QP versus like all of these other things and how to operate and stories of like union struggles and working within that system. And just like knowing that every struggle that we were going through, through the whole process, um, that I was not alone in experiencing that there was precedent and I had comrades who had been there before and knew how to deal with it. And um, like that was so valuable and so important. Um, uh, what else have I learned? Gosh, uh, how to make a podcast. Um, learn that. Uh, everyone listen to the Red Review. I know we've we've been on a bit of a hiatus um, lately, but um, I'm so proud of the work we've done with the Red Review. Um, how to do electoral politics um, in a way that is principled and just and does not compromise any of your principles. Um, and honestly, one of the biggest things is like how how to have principles. Like I think Flo, Flo kind of alluded to this, but just like, you know, knowing that like, you know, if I get flack or pushback for my uh, advocacy, uh, for like my pro-Palestine advocacy, for example, um, knowing that if I get pushback for that, I know I have people I can talk to and who will help me work through whatever comes out of that and have strategies for how to deal with it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I'm not alone in that struggle and I have people who are going to have my back no matter what. Um, and also on, on the flip side of that, if I say some shit that is outrageous or unprincipled or whatever the case may be, they're going to call me the hell out. <laughs> like if I do something that is anti-democratic or unfair or in any way um, detrimental or harmful, I know that there are going to be there are going to be people who are not going to be afraid to say what's what and disagree with me with the understanding that, like, we're still comrades. So I guess that's another thing is like how to have constructive disagreements, how to have conversations about really hard things with a lot of different ideas and no one right answer, but how to come to a constructive consensus. 30 seconds. <laughs> and of course, you know, learning Robert's rules and how to chair meetings. Okay. So. Thank you very much. So we're going to go back now to the list. So I'll check, chat later to see if there's more people. But so far we have Gary. And then I, when Gary uh, asks his question, I will read the one from Gary. Go ahead, Gary. You're on mute, Gary. You're still on mute, Gary. Okay. 
No, why you're okay. Your time will start now. Okay. Why do we need revolutionary socialists to uh, provide leadership for the struggle for against the oppression of uh, uh, based on gender and sexual orientation? Um, and there are two, at least two fundamental reasons that have to do with the nature of capitalism. One is, this is a, a, a division. Let's, you know, let's face it, the vast majority of people with with non-cis gender and, and uh, sexual orientations, non, uh, you know, heterosexual sexual orientations are in the working class. That's the thing about all the oppressed groups. Most of them are in the working class. So the capitalist class uses all these different forms of oppression to divide the working class, to point off in weird directions and keep keep us looking away from the ruling class, which is the real enemy. And there are, one of the reasons we wanna be involved is because it is not only our job to fight all forms of oppression, but it is our job to unite the working class. And there's no hope of doing that unless we can uh, teach the working class that all of its members are comrades. So that's one. The second thing is that capitalism wants to defend the nuclear family. Capitalism has to not only exploit the current working class, it has to see that a, that a next generation of workers is created. In uh, capitalist production, uh, we, there's the, the, the product that workers make, and of course workers are the only ones that add any value anywhere in society, uh, is divided into two parts, a necessary product and the surplus product. The necessary product is, the, is what, what we mean, but what Marx meant by that was, the, was wages. It, it's wages and benefits. It's what keeps the working class alive so they can keep producing profit for the capitalist class. But it also includes the production of the next generation. And there has to be a next generation of workers. And that whole task of raising the next generation of workers has been thrown onto the working class. In social society, there would be so much, that would be socialized so much. I mean, there were so many social services that would, uh, make children part of a community, schooling, early, early uh, childhood ed education, child care of all sorts, it would become very much a social business of, of raising the next generation. But capitalism doesn't want that cost, so it forces it on to workers' homes, workers' families, and they, and, and they have to do it as best they can in the circumstances. Now, all the all the people that are not interested in a in a heterosexual child rearing uh, nuclear family are undercutting that, and and so they're uh, they're a threat, an economic threat to capitalism in a very fundamental way. And so uh, it's, this is uh, it's, it's not just because capitalists uh, want to pick on these uh, on uh, people that don't have heterosexual and cis. Uh, orientation, it's that these people are threatening their future profit and, uh, you know, we, we don't care. <laughs> so, so that I just wanted to say that it's a pretty, it's a pretty fundamental thing and it's very, very related at the core to the job of socialism. It's not an add-on, it comes from the core of our struggle. Thank you, Gary. Okay, so the question from Carrie is, how do socialist action, political education, and advocacy work without becoming status quo, single issued, orientated campaign? So that's the two questions. I have three minutes to to uh, to answer, and I will start with uh, Victor. I think. Um... I, I have seen, at least in, in uh, my time watching and observing and researching politics, many candidates, many people who ran, many smaller groups who have become single issue entities um, that do put something to the very forefront and in doing so lose uh, a great deal of their broader message. Uh, I don't think socialist action is in danger of that. Um, I don't think that that will be a problem for us, at least not in the years to come, uh, at, at bare minimum. Um, but the way that you can avoid that 
is simply to pay attention to the world that we live in and listen to the people who are being oppressed. You cannot become a single issue party if you are going to involve heavily the knowledge and experiences of minorities. It's just not possible because there are many issues that face many different minorities in this country. There are different issues that face gay men. There are different issues that face gay women. There are different issues that face mothers and uh, children and ev everybody who is not the billionaire class. They have things they must be defended against from the billionaire class. So I don't think we have any danger of becoming a single issue party because I think there's so many things that we know are wrong that we need to defend against and help people to be voices, to listen to them. I don't think that's a problem for us. Um, uh, to comment on what Gary said about uh, capitalism, trying to create a nation of people who are subservient and uh, complacent with capitalism. They've been doing that for centuries. They have done their absolute best to create a nation of people who they can force to do whatever they want. Uh, they have created a nation of slaves, whether it's wage slavery or actual slavery, or like we have now, the modern day uh, prison system in the United States is modern day slavery because they put in very stupid little rules that if broken will get you 20 years doing hard labor, making license plates or tables or chairs or whatever you, you want to call it. They, they, they get their labor for free for men who cannot live a free life. That is slavery. And they currently are living through it in the United States and even here in Canada. So it, it's, it's not something that has... Uh, has has been not noticed by so socialists across the world. Um, but during the construction of the school system in the United States, um, Rockefeller said, I do not need a nation of thinkers. I need a nation of workers. So education was not the forefront of that. The forefront of it was creating people who can go into the workforce and who will be workers. They don't need to think, create new ideas. They don't need to invent anything that won't make me money. I just need them to work. So it's something that we've seen in our everyday lives, the downfall of our education. All across the country, there are pointless classes being taught that will never help anybody. Nobody's ever taught how to be an adult in school. They're just taught how to listen, how to respect the rules, how to go along with the flow, how to understand that the people that are telling you to do things are above you and you have to listen to them. And that, that was what I took away from school right up until, uh, you know, probably my 16, 17 years old me. Um, anytime a teacher said anything, I listened. It, they have a, a, no question about whether or not it was real or true or or anything like that. I just listened. If they said we needed to go somewhere, I went somewhere. If they said we needed to do a project, I did a project. So if you go through schooling and all you're taught is how to listen, how to respect the rules, and how to be molded by a society into the person they want you to be, that's what capitalism wants. It wants a person seconds. who they can control. And I think uh, just to bring back very quickly to the point that uh, Emily mentioned earlier uh, about the LGBTQIA community, queerness is inherently a split from the norm and that scares the hell out of capitalism. Okay, am I? Heck yeah. So yeah, thank you, Gary, for, for those comments. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's like, you know, queerness, queerness pushes back against the narrative of, you know, of, of the reproductive labor. Um, so um, how to like, how do we be a political advocate and organizer um, and do education without becoming a single issue party? Um, diversity, diversity of our leadership. I mean, we have a huge leadership team here at Socialist Action, which is amazing. And I feel extremely privileged to be among you, but like, you know, the perspectives and the priorities that I'm going to bring as, a white middle-ish class queer woman, um, those those perspectives are gonna be different than the perspectives that Carrie is bringing or Gary is bringing or Flo is bringing or uh, you know, whoever is, we're chatting with. Um, we're all gonna bring different perspectives. And I think this is also part of the advantage of the United Front is that like we have our focuses, you know, we do 
our advocacy within the NDP, we do our advocacy in the labor movement, um, we do solidarity demonstrations with Venezuela and Palestine and Cuba. Um, like we have, we have the things that we kind of spearhead, but we are able to kind of keep our fingers in so many different pies because we're not trying to organize all of the events that we help or help out with. You know, we're not trying to organize every single rally that we go to, but we show up or we co-sponsor events or um, help produce material or promote events or whatever the case may be. So, um, and so through United Front Tactics, you know, we're working with um, the um, independent Jewish voices um, um, or um, the anti-war movement, Hamilton Coalition to Stop War. Um, we're working with ACORN, we're working with, as I say, like all of our fingers are in all of these different pies because so many of our comrades are coming from all of these different perspectives and backgrounds and they can get involved and bring that necessarily necessary socialist perspective. Um, and I think this is why, you know, revolutionary so socialists tend to make good leaders and tend to get involved in leadership capacities within the organizations that we participate in because we don't accept platitudes. We don't accept the easy answers. We don't accept the settlements. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of, and, and, I, and to be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with single issue campaigns. People have their own lives and they know what they can sustain. And if there's a campaign, it's just like, you know, screw this bill, you know, stop the sprawl Hamilton like a great example of a single issue coalition that came together with a lot of different groups to say, this is our issue. This is what we're gonna focus on and we're gonna do this really intensively. And then, and, and that's it. It's great, awesome. Like, and then, and then they disperse and that's fine. Um, so there, there's nothing wrong with single issue campaigns, but I don't think that's ever a risk for us just because of the approach we take and because of United Front Tactics. Um, to kind of, uh, Stephen made a comment in the chat about like, defeating capitalism with socialism is the single issue where all of these issues meet. I, I mean, I agree, but I, I'm always wary of kind of any kind of thirty seconds reductionist thinking. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, just because, um, there are a lot of, unfortunately, we've seen it time and again, there are a lot of purported socialists who say, why are you, why are you bothering with all of this queer stuff? What does this have to do with the liberation of the working class? Or why are you so concerned with indigenous rights? Don't you realize we need to do X, Y, Z for the workers? Um, and so I, I, I'm always hesitant to kind of say, well, it's all socialism, because that can really erase a lot of these critical differences um, that are really important to highlight. Diversity makes the movement. We're all pulling on a different thread of the tapestry, and one thread isn't going to do much, but if we all keep pulling all, all of the threads, it'll all unravel. Thank you. Flo? Yeah, well, I like this question and where it's going. It's interesting discussion. Um, Oh, yeah, I don't think we have much danger, I guess, of falling into a uh, single issue campaigns, at least socialist action is like a broad organization, because we want system change, right? We want revolution. And I think that approaching things on a, you know, systemic structural basis means that you can't really go at it one issue at a time. Like that's kind of um, what my experience was more in, in college was like trying to like tackle the beast with all these little like you know this thing and this thing but re what was really missing was the the grounding um and actually like seeing how it is all connected uh through capitalism like, i think there's definitely a fine line to be walked um between uh reducing everything to just you know it's a problem of socialism because that also kind of implies uh the sort of utopianism where if we just get you know uh, economic democracy, then all of the other social problems that we have will just disappear, which I don't think is going to happen at all. Like there's still going to be types of, you know, prejudice and interpersonal bias and people will still have arguments and not like each other. And 
you know, all this other stuff that just has to do with um, more idealistic or uh, I don't know. But uh, I think, too, that, you know, just as we've been talking about kind of elucidating the ways that capitalism exacerbates all of these issues or has has brought us to where we are today and understanding what the relationship is between these, you know, diverse groups and sections with their own uh, personal struggles, but how that they are connected uh, through capitalism. To me, that would be the meaning of like intersectionality. Um, and I think maybe it's a failure of consciousness and of, of some comrades or people in the socialist movement if they don't, if they can't see that. Um, but rather just try to like dismiss it um, because yeah, we're all coming at this from a, a different pathway, but we're also experiencing the same kind of, you know, hegemonic oppression. Um, and so, you know, there's a connection, but it's, you can't reduce it to just one problem. There's a variety of problems and uh, the way that, you know, they're sort of expressed in society, I think is through, um, the modes of production and, and of capitalism. So yeah, it's a bit of a give and take there. And uh, 30 seconds. Okay. Lastly, yeah, just kind of focusing on, uh, on the systemic nature of what we do and also our um, the tactics that we employ through the United Front and being in a, a variety of different, like, you know, sites of the working class. Also, I think um, kind of safeguards the organization from just collapsing into one single issue as well. Okay, so we have about five minutes, so I'll give you two minutes each to answer a question. Well, a statement slash question that was put in the chat by Trevor. And he's saying a lot of people who deny realities of existential threats seem to be suckered into obscure conspiracy theories surrounding them. Simply dismissing them as conspiracy theorists seem to only encourage them and their numbers continue to grow. How does one go about trying to dispel conspiracy theories and convince people of the real reason behind climate change and denial? We're all familiar with climate denial. The realities and prospects of nuclear war, survivalist communities are completely right wing and have bizarre ideas about surviving and even thriving in nuclear Armageddon, or the real causes of the pandemic and the racist overtones that inevitably in follow. The number of people who believe such truly bizarre things is growing in rural towns like the one I'm from. So I'll give you each two minutes, starting with Flo, to um, give your view on that. Okay, man, yeah, that's a, an important question of our time, I feel like, because it's kind of just like, how do you respond or deal with the reactionary right um and the left i mean i guess parts of the left go go into that uh, side of things and it's just reactionary to me um because it's simpler to understand it's always easier to just target something or someone and say like that's the problem that one thing i <laughs> kind of Going back to even the previous question, um, yeah, it's just always easier to be reductive um, and to caricature something or someone um, when really a lot of our issues are more systemic and they're more complicated and that makes them harder to solve because it means people are going to have to like work together and uh, get over their, you know, individualism and other things. So overall, though, I think that uh, you don't want to be too dismissive, not too hand wavy, but try to redirect, get the intention of what they're saying and maybe trying to understand where that's coming from, because it's a lot of the time, you know, fueled by um, fear and uncertainty. And it's, to me, I just feel like people get sort of tricked into into thinking that it's um something to do with 
people around them rather than the structures uh, that they're living under and the the fact that yeah some we've allowed we've allowed some bad people to have a lot of power and money and um, you know that part is true but um, unless we do change the system 30 seconds stuff's going to keep coming you know it's going to keep happening so the only way to sort of move beyond that is to uh, create an economic and transparent and uh, democratic system of economy. Thank you, Flo. Emily, two minutes. Yes. So quickly wrapping up, uh, I think this is such an interesting thing. And like, I, I am always so heartbroken with a lot of conspiracy theorists. And I, I don't know if I'm the, the only one here who's experienced this, but there's a lot of times I look at people who get sucked into conspiracy theories and I think like kind of there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, like, because we're all here because we feel like we've seen behind the curtain. We, we know the system is broken. We know that, you know, the government has dumped petrochemicals in our water systems or, you know, lied to us about the health consequences of policies that they've done or, um, you know, like we know that corporations and governments lie to us. They lie all the time. Um, so I, I don't blame people for falling for conspiracy theories. Um, and, you know, there are, I mean, there's so many things that are true, like, you know, like the, the coup in El Salvador that's sponsored by Chiquita Banana, like, you know, right? Like, there are so many things that have happened uh, in recent history that sound ridiculous. And it's only because we have access to declassified CIA files that we can say like, look, we're not crazy, this happened. You know, like experiments on lobotomy patients and LSD trying to make people hallucinate in the Cold War, like there's absolutely bonkers stuff that has actually happened. So I don't blame anyone for having a really hard time sorting the fact from the fiction that has a grain of truth in it. Um, and I think that's that's kind of what I was meaning earlier when I talked about being the net. Because there are a lot of people who are standing on the edge who are going, I know the building is on fire. What do I do? Where do I go? Who's gonna catch me? If I if I try to jump out of this burning building and I don't know where to go, um, if we are there to be a net, like they're, you know they're going to get caught by something. Better to be us. Um, and I I know like I I know a lot of folks who kind seconds. of count, go down a lot of winding routes and. There are a lot of ways to kind of get to socialism and many people have talked about like, oh yeah, I used to be like total conspiracy theorist and then I kind of saw through all of the nonsense. Um, so I, th I think like our role is to say like, here's, yeah, we've seen behind the curtain too. Here's what we're doing about it. Um, yeah, and as, as Flo said, kind of not blaming people but blaming structures. I think that's the difference. Um, and yeah, as you say, like wanting to blame people and it always comes back to anti-Semitism and racism, it's the, the longest, most historic prejudices blame marginalized people for systemic injustice because it's so much easier. It's so much easier than believing that the system you live in and have been taught to believe in is rotten to the core. It's so much easier to believe that there's just the wrong people involved. Thank you, Emily. Victor? Yeah, it's, it, it is a very nuanced question with a lot of information that, um, like, I would love to have six hours to go over because you, you'd need a lot of time. But um, Emily said something then that's just very accurate. And I, I see it daily here now because one of the, the groups of people that are blamed for the housing crisis in Newfoundland is refugees and immigrants. And like, you know, how is it their fault? It makes me so angry because they're le leaving a country to come somewhere else looking for a house and our government is housing them, but not doing anything else. Like you're not doing anything else to help these people. And 
people go into it thinking, oh, we don't have any houses because you're giving them away. But the fact of the matter is we don't have any houses because you're not building any new houses. This is not the fault of the refugees and the immigrants. This is the fault of the government failing to accommodate a situation that they themselves have created. They know there's not enough houses. It's not the fault of the refugees and the immigrants. Blaming victims is not the answer. And you see it all the time. Why is the economy so bad? Oh, it's the Jews. Uh, why is the uh, why is marriage falling apart? Oh, it's the lack of the traditional family and all the queer people coming into uh, the world and, and causing problems. It's always the fault of someone else. Uh, Emily laid it out perfectly. We never want to look at the systems that we have lived in and grown up in as being the problem. We want to point and say, it's them. It's them over there. It's that group that's causing the issues rather than realizing we live in a mansion made of issues and made of problems. And every door we open, there's just new ones. So we would rather look across the street and say, nope, it's the neighbors. It's the neighbor's fault. They're doing it. So I've seen it every day here because that's who gets blamed. It's the people who are the other, the people who are not you. So that's a very nuanced issue about the psychology of how that happens. Um, there was a recent thing that came out. A guy went into like a far right extremist meeting slash gathering. Um, and after he came out of it, he said the scariest thing about seeing these people who are radical and who are extremely divisive and racist and just like completely nuts. Uh, the scariest thing is that they looked like me. They looked normal. They looked like people you would see walking down on the street and he said it, it made him realize that you don't need to be some uh buck wild person living in the woods uh to be someone who has been so brainwashed into believing something that you turn to violence to do it so there's a long list of things that lead people to the wrong organizations and to the wrong groups and frustration and anger will push you to that it will push you to be radical i would much rather you be radical with us uh out in marches holding banners uh making speeches online whatever you need to do to get that energy out in a good way i am right there for you um but there are definitely a lot of ways that people get led to those other groups and having the king of the blue bird app constantly spreading misinformation uh, on his own platform is not helping. I'm just putting that out there. Okay, thank you, Victor. Thank you. Okay, folks, this has been an educational and inspiring presentation by from Flo and Emily and, and Victor. You've certainly set a high bar for this for this conference. And I'm looking forward to the next session, which will start sharp at four o'clock. What is democratic centralism? Our speakers will be Gary Porter and Helen Smith. So I would like to see you all back at four. Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome back to the second session of the Socialist Action Spring Education Conference. This conference, of course, can also be viewed at a later date on the SA YouTube channel. And our next panel, and the second is, which is our second panel, is what is democratic centralism? And our first speaker, Gary Porter, was organizer, or, organization secretary of the League for Socialist Action and went on to be one of Canada's leading chartered accountants. Gary is a leading member of Socialist Action and NDP Socialist Caucus. He resides in Victoria. Welcome, Gary. Okay, so am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, democratic centralism. There's a great discussion of democratic centralism in chapter seven of Paul LeBlanc's Lenin and the Revolutionary Party. He explains that the term predates Lenin by many years and was first used in 1865 by J.B. Schweitzer, a la Salian. Furthermore, in Russia, it was first used by the Mensheviks at a November 1905 conference in a resolution titled On the Organization of the Party, adopted at the conference. Um, they agree that the RSDLP, that is the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, 
must not be organized, must be organized in accordance with the principle of democratic centralism. A month later, the Bolsheviks adopted the same term. A, a resolution titled on party organization states, recognizing as indisputable the principle of democratic centralism, the conference considers the broad implementation of the elective principle necessary. And while granting elected centers full powers in the matters of ideological and practical leadership, they are at the same time subject to recall. Their actions will be broadly, will be given broad publicity and they are to be strictly accountable for their activities. There is virtually no difference between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks about the need for democratic centralism or its meaning. So claims that the two factions differed over this quote, Leninist quote, unquote, organizational breakthrough are simply mistaken. Moreover, the two groups had resolved many outstanding differences between uh, following the failed 1905 revolution. Menshevik leader Pavel Axelrod stated that, on the whole, the Menshevik tactics have hardly differed from the Bolsheviks. I am not even sure that they differed from them at all. Lenin concurred, the tactics adopted by the period of the whirlwind by which he met the revolution did not further estrange the two wings of the Social Democratic Party, but brought them closer together. The upsurge of the revolutionary tide pushed aside disagreements, compelling all Social Democrats to adopt militant tactics. In any case, whatever the differences, whatever differences would resurface in the period leading up to 1917, democratic centralism was not one of them. At a unity conference held in 1906, the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks voted for a resolution that stated, all party organizations are built on the principles of democratic centralism. The report on the commission that adopted this resolution was given by a Menshevik, Sigorsky Komal, who stated that we accept the formula for membership unanimously. In other words, there was no objection to what some would characterize exclusively as a Leninist norm. The reason for this is simple. Democratic centralism was not an issue. The key difference between Mensheviki and Bolsheviki, to use the Russian terminology, was around the role of the bourgeoisie in the revolution. Trotsky, of course, argued that the bourgeoisie was too weak to carry through the, the political and economic tasks of the bourgeois revolution, that only a workers' government could do this. In the event, in 1917, the bourgeoisie did not uh, act as Trotsky had predicted. They, carried on the war, they did not give land to the peasants, uh, and they could not even meet the basic needs of the workers for food. On this time, Lenin had come to agree with Trotsky and raised the demand all power to the Soviets, which implied the overthrow of the bourgeois parliament called the Duma. The Mensheviks opposed this, believing that there must be a period during which the bourgeoisie carried through the tasks of ending all feudal relations, developing capitalist production and increasing productivity of agriculture sufficient to free up the, work, the peasants to become workers in the cities. But the bourgeoisie was too undeve under, underdeveloped itself and paralyzed by a great fear of a very class conscious and increasingly self-confident working class in Russia. Luxembourg in her critique of Lenin's one step forward, two steps backward writes, Lenin's thesis is that the party central committee should be able to have the privilege of naming all the local committees of the party. Whatever else one might say about this, this is not what we think of ordinarily when we hear the term democratic centralism. That would be like our central committee naming all the executives and organizers of the branches, a highly centralized form. Whatever else one might say about this, it is not what we think of ordinarily when we hear, hear the term democratic centralism. It is instead a reference to the specific practice rooted in the exigencies of the Russian class struggle, forced to operate under repressive and clandestine conditions. Not even Luxembourg was opposed to democratic centralism, but to centralism where in her view, it was unnecessary. James P. Cannon never favored the practice that was, that was mentioned in One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, again, written during a period of clandestine and underground activity. Um, 
And, and that's in, uh, despite the fact that he was committed to the sort of democratic centralism that evolved under Zinoviev's authority when he was head of the Communist International. Note that Luxembourg is, is opposed, not that Luxembourg was opposed to centralism itself. When it takes shape from the self activity of the working class, it's a good thing. Centralism is the social, in a socialist sense, is not an absolute thing applicable to any phase whatsoever of the labor movement. It's a tendency which becomes more real, proportion to the development, political training, and experience acquired by the working masses in the course of their struggle. Of course, democratic centralism that defines many who describe themselves as Leninist organizations today have, have little to do with Lenin's call for, quote, freedom to criticize, but unity in action. Somewhere along the line, it became a formula for many, for many, for ideological homogeneity. It states that the freedom to criticize is permissible during pre-convention discussion, a period that tolerates atypical behavior every couple of years or so. Those who have experienced this version of freedom to criticize understand that it is no such thing. Instead, it is mainly an opportunity for the secondary leadership of the party to salute the central leadership for the brilliance of the line resolutions presented at the convention. Those who reach the conclusion that the line resolutions are full of baloney are ultimately viewed as scratches that are in danger of turning into gap green. Such organizations, the main danger from the standpoint of medical analogies is hardening of the arteries. I just want to say an aside here, of course, we have discussions going on all the time. We invite our whole membership to the central committee meetings and they can, they can, they can hear what the central committee is discussing. We have an online discussion channel where people can raise issues and discuss them all times, not just pre-convention. Democratic centralism is the application of the Marxist method to the question of how best to organize, be the working class, in the revolutionary transformation of society. The principles of democratic centralism do not provide a standard blueprint for revolutionary socialist organization, but rather an approach to the process of collective decision-making and collective action that can take a variety of forms corresponding to the development of the organization and the changing demands of the class struggle. The development of democratic centralist theory and practice has been to some extent neglected by the revolutionary socialist movement. In our own country, for example, the new revolutionary socialist movement of the 1970s tended itself with imi imi imitating organizational forms of the parties of the 1920s and 30s, parties that were more highly developed and operating under a vastly different set of circumstances. This mimicry eventually produced parodies of revolutionary socialist parties, complete with central committees that have nothing to centralize and mass lines that have mass base. This, among other things, is what is an important phrase, among other things, is what happened to the Socialist Workers' Party in the U.S. and the Communist League in Canada. But not only the indicators, not only the imitators were at fault, the models themselves flawed. Our task today is to recover democratic centralist theory from dogmatist distortions and to develop that theory further based on the critical appraisal of the experience of the revolutionary socialist movement. The task is in turn an integral part of the constant struggle to develop and maintain a general line of revolutionary socialist movement, a line that must inevitably address the issue of revolutionary socialist organization. So what are the principles of democratic centralism? Democratic centralism is a method of organization that embodies two elements seemingly in contradiction, democracy and centralism, in an ever-changing dialectical relationship of struggle and unity. Thus, there is no formula for the correct proportions of democracy and centralism. Instead, revolutionary socialists must determine the synthesis of the two that enables their organizations to provide coherent and decisive leadership to the working class at any given point in time. The democratic aspect of democratic centralism ensures effective decision-making. It includes thorough discussion of political questions, full airing of minority viewpoints, collective decision-making, period or periodic review 
of delegated decisions, report from members on their work and analysis, provisions for initiatives from members, and criticism of all aspects of political organizational theoretical practice. Now, there's a lot to this. The democratic practice of the organization rests on the principle that collective decisions made by a majority vote after a full, informed, and frank discussion are more likely to reflect the interests of the working class than decisions made without such discussion. Because it brings the experiences of the whole party to bear. Centralism is necessary to ensure unity of action, carrying out the organization's decisions, to provide strategic and tactical flexibility in dealing, after all, with a highly centralized bourgeois state. Therefore, the workers' leadership has to be centralized to keep nimbleness required to respond. And to create the basis of social practice for evaluating the organization's line, centralism includes leadership at all levels, summing up the ideas and the experience of the membership drawing up proposals for the organization to consider, presenting political arguments for the positions it recommends, implementing policy and responding decisively to guide the organization and the working class through the twists and turns of the class struggle. However, it is the unity of democracy and centralism that guides us, and it is essential to understand the interdependence of democracy and centralism Without democracy, the leadership lacks accurate information about the actual unfolding of the class struggle, and the especially about the needs and capabilities of the masses. Instead, it must develop strategy and tactics by applying Marxist theory to its own partial view of the political situation. But as Lenin put it, the actual unfolding of the class struggle is infinitely richer than the most advanced theory. Democracy means tapping the creativity and experience of many people to make sure that the organization's line corresponds to the real development of class struggle in a scientific way. On the other hand, without centralism, the experiences of the party members and of the masses will remain scattered instead of drawn together in a, into a, toward a sharp point. The organization would be unable to translate its knowledge and, and experience into a material force that inter intervenes in and changes history. In other words, there can be no democracy without centralism and no centralism without democracy. But while democracy and centralism support each other, there is always a tension between them. Does everyone need to discuss every decision? When has discussion gone on long enough and become unproductive and it's time to make a decision? How should leaders encourage and respond to criticism from members? How can minority views be respected? When is it appropriate to reevaluate a decision? When should the organization change its structure or practices to, and, and uh, reorganize differently, still under democratic centralism? These kinds of questions are faced constantly by revolutionary political groups at all stages of development. From this basic analysis, we can draw a number of conclusions about what a revolutionary socialist organization requires to make democratic centralism work. Number one is political unity, fundamental political unity. Once only overall political unity can stimulate individuals to make the commitment necessary to participate in a revolutionary socialist organization or to motivate a minority to subordinate, subordinate itself to carry out the proposals of the majority. The degree of unity required for revolutionary socialist organization depends on the development of the revolutionary socialists themselves and the nature of their political tasks. There is no one correct level of unity. As we argue further on, um, on further on, party building attempts, attempts to attempts to force organizational consolidation in the absence of political unity on basic tasks can only lead to splits and the proliferation of sterile sects. So for example, when I took a look at the political revolution, resolution that is, will be presented next week at our convention. I looked first at the tasks, and I agree with the tasks, although I have some differences on some parts of the analysis. But fundamentally, what we are doing 
Ayatollah. Cadre development. Democratic centralism requires that members have a firm, critical, and individual grasp of Marxist theory and practice. If too many members lack these abilities, the party will lack that dialogue between members and leaders, base and center, party and masses. This is essentially, that is, is a, the kind of dialogue that is essential to democratic centralist decision making. Political, okay, political leadership, second requirement. Revolutionary socialist leadership has the responsibility of guiding the organization's work. Uh, a role that is important at all times. The role of the leadership takes on particular importance in periods of revolutionary crisis or repression. Its work therefore requires a high degree of theoretical and practical experience in mature political judgment. It requires further an ability to lead, not simply command the, orga uh, the organization and through it, the masses. Also important to the educational, is the educational role of leadership, helping develop new leaders from among the members and increasing the theoretical and practical capabilities of the membership at large. I guess uh, one aside here is that we do believe in leadership. I mean, we know it's necessary. And that's one of the reasons why we're not anarchists. Criticism and self-criticism, another requirement. Changing conditions, incorrect political line and mistakes in implementing line or in style of work are all inevitable and require regular summation and reevaluation of work. Mistakes will be much more serious, uh, sorry, mistakes will be more or less serious, more or less harmful to the movement. But the failure to examine and correct errors is even more serious and harmful. To make democratic centralism work, criticism and self-criticism, the ability to look at yourself and say, wait, I think I'm doing this wrong. <clears throat> um, must be practiced throughout the organization. Leaders and members must learn to assess honestly the strengths and weaknesses of both individuals and party units and the organization as a whole. Equally important, this dialogue of criticism and self-criticism must be practiced not only within the organization, but between the organization and the masses that they are attempting to lead. Attempts to place the party, a party above the criticism of masses have taken several forms. Some have claimed that the party is always right because Marxism-Leninism is a science. Others have tried to deny that the organization has in fact changed its line or have re refused to explain reasons why. Such attempts to mystify revolutionary socialist work deceives no one and have no, serious, no place in a serious Marxist, Marxist practice. The party and the working class can only win by transforming themselves in the process of transforming society. Neither aspect of the revolution can succeed without the practice of Serious criticism and self-criticism. What are the, some of the problems that have come up in terms of democratic centralism? In the decades since the founding of the Bolshevik party and of the Comintern, the revolutionary socialist movement has gained enormous experience in applying democratic centralism. However, this practice has been little examined. The errors have been persisted in and often extolled and problems have been ignored and explained away. This section of my talk examines some of the mistakes and problems that have appeared in efforts of revolutionary socialists to practice democratic centralism. First, monolithic unity. We argued above that overall political unity was essential in the practice of democratic centralism. But political uni unity has often been interpreted, interpreted in the revolutionary socialist movement to mean unanimity. The key error in revolutionary socialist organizations has been an insistence <coughs> on monolithic unity of thought throughout the organization. Many other errors either flow from this view or are closely associated with it. Both revolutionary socialist and Bolshevik observers agree that the Bolshevik party under Lenin's leadership was a lively organization marked by both sharp political struggle internally 
and a disciplined commitment to united action. This was a very mature Bolshevik party. However, during the 1920s, it became more and more the norm to insist that unity of action required unity of thought. This trend was a response by the CPSU, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, to the dangers of civil war, foreign intervention, and sharp rise and sharp class struggle. It was generalized through the World Revolutionary Socialist Movement, throughout the, the World Socialist Movement, by the CPSU's leadership of the Communist International. During the revolutionary period, the party grew geometrical. <clears throat> especially after the seizure of power. Thousands of workers and soldiers and peasants poured in. This was good, but the overall theoretical level of the party dropped. Along with these new recruits came thousands of petty bourgeois professors, merchants, bureaucrats, opportunists just trying to get in on the right side. <coughs> Sorry. but with no commitment to a socialist transformation. These became the apparatchiks, the privileged bureaucratic caste supporting Stalin. They supported monolithic centralism, not democracy. They were protecting their privileges. This emphasis on uniformity of thought is wrong for several reasons. It runs counter to the basic view of dialectical materialism on the universality of contradiction, while it's suggesting that contradiction exists everywhere except in the party. But where there is no disagreement, there is no life. Struggle over the formulation of theory and the evaluation of practice is essential to the development of any science. <clears throat> including Marxism. Without this democratic debate, the clash of differing experiences and opinions, serious evaluation of political line <coughs> or work on either the organizational or the individual level becomes impossible. I'm just gonna take a short, a few seconds to let my throat clear. <coughs> Few people could, few people would claim that a perfect revolutionary socialist party is possible. Yet many implicitly have made the claim, made this claim by arguing that revolutionary socialist parties can do without the powerful corrective practice of criticism and debate, <coughs> or have paid only lip service that need. It will damage party unity. They but the unity of a party that is capable of correcting its errors is worth very little to the working class. <clears throat> Sooner or later, its errors will collect and overwhelm it, now that, no matter how promising it's beginning. The insistence on unity of thought, ah, uh, this is terrible. The insistence on unity of thought thus stifles the organization's life. Who will admit to disagreements with the leadership's policies or make serious criticisms when frankness might invite disciplinary action? Those who suppress their objections or deny their own perceptions of political reality are forced to adopt a sort of dogmatism in order to be able to function at all. Many of the more capable people, those who are capable of finding their political bearings independently, will leave the organization. This emphasis on unity of thought seems to rest on two points. First, people fear that frank debate will inevitably turn into factionalism, thus destroying the organization's unity. This question is a complicated one, which I discussed separately below. <clears throat> the second reason runs something like this. Unity of action is more important than being right. Better that the organization is wrong than that the leadership representing that unity be questioned. This reasoning makes unity of action an end in itself, divorced from the idea of scientific mass practice. The organization itself and not its political, not its political analysis and line have become primary. 
<laughs> this position represents bourgeois concepts of centralism. Gary, maybe you can take a short break and, and, and just take a good drink, comrade. You have lots of time. This board, these bourgeois positions must not be confused with the proletarian concept of centralism. <laughs> Uh, skip over one here. Go to the other side of the equation, political, <coughs> oh, sorry, health democracy. The tendency to correct the problems of over-centralism. I've got to get a glass of water. Yes, go ahead, comrade. Take your time. We have lots of time. Find a cough drop, too, Gary. Okay, the, ten the uh, tendency to correct the problems. <clears throat> I don't think I can carry on right now. I'll have to finish, let Ellen go. Okay, sure, we'll let Ellen go and you can come back. No, no, no problem, Tom. Okay, so comrades, we're, we're going to move now to uh -huh. our second speaker and then come back to Gary in a few minutes. Our next speaker is Helen Smith. She is a housing and seniors rights activist, a member of the Peace BC Humanist Association and the NDP Socialist Caucus. Helen is a leading member of Socialist Action in Vancouver. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. And thank you, Gary, for a very thoughtful presentation. Um, I'll be, uh, it's fortunate, I'll be covering some different things in yourself. So uh, that's good. And we look forward to coming back to you um, afterwards. I start off with a definition. I did much of my research on the internet, um, and a lot of it is based on Lenin. Uh, and I'll be listing some of my sources as I go along. A definition I found is a f that democratic centralism is a form of democracy in which political decisions are reached by a voting process and are binding on all members of the political party. Lenin discussed the process in what is to be done in 1902, and this is usually considered the founding text of democratic centralism. Uh, Lenin on party democracy argued that democratic centralism prevents factionalism. Factionalism leads to less friendly relations among members and can be exploited by enemies. In what is to be done, Lenin modeled democratic centralism for the German Social Democratic Party and described it as freedom of discussion, unity of action. What is to be done, the title was based on an 1863 novel by Russian revolutionary Nikolai Chernyshevsky. It was argued in 1902 by Lenin that workers would not spontaneously <coughs> become political by fighting battles over wages, hours, etc., but must form a political party or vanguard. The pamphlet caused a split between the Lenin's Bolsheviks and the Men Mensheviks in 1903. The Mensheviks supported a looser position in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party in 1903. The actual term democratic centralism only came into use around 1917 as coined by Lenin, but the principle had been discussed much earlier by Marx in the International Workingmen's Association in the 19th century. In 1917, the Party Congress in Petrograd defined democratic centralism as one, all directing bodies of the party shall be elected, Two, all bodies shall give periodic accounts of their activi activity to the party. 
Three, there shall be strict party discipline and subordination of the minority. Four, all decisions of higher bodies shall be absolutely binding on all party members. Decision is made after a period of debate, voted on, and then all members are expected to follow that decision and not to continue debating it. The goal is to avoid a decision being undermined by the view of a minority. Before and after the vote, discussion and criticism is permitted in all forms, but once the resolution has been actioned, discussion and criticism is forbidden. At party meetings, criticism is allowed, but not at public meetings. This is known as unity in action. Within the party apparatus, the minority are not allowed to be discriminated against, but they must not express their differences in public meetings. They are expected to express the party position when they are speaking on behalf of the party. Trotsky wrote a letter on democratic centralism in 1937. Before a convention, the problem is to formulate a political line for the next period and for democracy to triumph over centralism. The success of democratic centralism shall be measured in the context of the development of the party, both on a national and an international scale. A feeling for proportion is very important. Trotsky wrote, each real revolutionist who, no who notes down the blunders of the party should first say to himself, we must bring into the party a dozen new workers. The new, the new young workers will call the skeptics grievance mongers and bring pessimists to order. In 1921, Lenin on party unity said that all work of the party should be truly friendly work. Documents shall be circulated to all members of the party for discussion, and all critics should take into account the party context, including the encirclement by enemies. The Central Committee must rid the party of all factionalism up to and including expulsion of members. After 1923, um, and under Stalin, the process was reversed and decisions were made at the top. Prior to that, the argument was about the importance of building a revolutionary party that was democratic. Engels earlier said that there were three forms of struggle, political, economic, and theoretical. Taking this up, Lenin said the workers would not develop class consciousness through economic or workplace struggles alone that they needed a party. The working class would only develop a trade union consciousness if left on its own. They needed a party to develop a revolutionary consciousness. In 1902, Lenin wrote about the social democratic parties in Germany and Russia and the challenge to them by what he termed the economists. These were bourgeois elements who viewed the struggle over wages and benefits in the trade unions as the only place and content of the struggle for socialism. He argued, Lenin argued instead, that while these economic struggles were a site of struggle for socialists, it did not rest there. There had to be a political dimension as well. The economists saw the political struggle as a superstructural struggle that followed economics. Lenin, however, saw the economists' economic reforms as, ask, as often connected with bourgeois politics, linked also to clerical struggles that would abolish the conditions. A struggle had to be waged at the political level as well. The economists were also seen as taking the spontaneism of the economic struggle and making a thing of itself. Spontaneism, which would include riots and terrorism, indicated that the struggle must be brought to a broader level through political struggle. There is no shortcut to revolution. The mass movement is important, but the crux of the matter is how to organize the mass of the working class to fulfill the socialist tasks that lay ahead. The workers needed to be educated on the full nature of the class struggle in the process of their economic struggles. Lenin warns about the infatuation with terrorism among the economists, 
those who make a fetish of individual acts of violence, which will only bring about state op the state op oppressive apparatus of the police and army and stifle the revolution. He speaks at length about this. He argues instead for building a mass movement, including converting segments of the army to the cause so that there can be a defensive element which is organic to the workers' cause. Economists see some single action as a spark for re revolution, when in reality, revolution comes about as a result of years of organization and struggle. It is not merely a trade union struggle or an act of terrorism that brings about socialism. There is no sidestepping the organizational element. The economic struggles must be given a political character. This means understanding that the flogging of peasants, the corruption of officials, and the police mistreatment of the common people, the extortion of taxes, and the persecution of ethnic minorities must all be understood in connection with the economic struggle against mass famine. The struggle for trade union rights must be linked to the right to strike, to struggle for enlightenment and knowledge, the removal of legal hindrances to the cooperative and trade union movements, for laws to protect women and children, and the improvement of labor conditions through health and factory legislation. It is more than just a struggle for economic reforms. Lenin goes on to describe the revolutionary social democrats as an organization of revolutionaries who make revolution their profession, where all distinctions between workers and intellectuals, trades and profession are erased and must be as secret as possible. The task is to raise the workers to the level of revolutionaries. Socialist action then, we are, a we are revolutionary socialists, Trotskyists and Leninists who advance a party program. We are also a party of the working class and we advance the party program through democratic centralism and building united fronts and anti-imperialist struggles. We make decisions through voting and at each party convention we debate and then vote on our analysis of the political situation and the tasks that lay ahead. Our main priorities are to build the Leninist Trotskyist party and to create a campaign party using united front tactics among the working class rooted in mass organizations. Each member is to step forward as a, to become a cadre, a professional revolutionary organizer to carry out political tasks. We are part of the movement to build a revolutionary workers international and we oppose capitalist austerity. We will debate this in the period leading up to the convention under, under the um, conditions of democratic uh, centralism. Comrades will present their positions to the convention and these will be voted on. And, and then following a majority vote, comrades will carry out the work of the party to the best of their ability. If a comrade remains part of a minority, it is expected that they will still present the party's majority position in public and will participate in the tasks the party sets out at convention. The NDP, um, one of our major the campaigns that we've been involved with for decades, as one of our main areas of work is to democratize the NDP and to build revolutionaries from within the party it is important to realize that the NDP is not democratic in any sense, real sense of the world, word. While the party structure suggests that it operates from the bottom up, in reality, decisions are being made at the top and are centered around an election machine set to win elections, not to listen to the membership. This is why we have, a str we have to struggle so hard to get our resolutions adopted at conventions. The leadership already has a plan set out that they want, they want to pursue, and they don't like to be derailed from their predetermined strategy. Resolutions are watered down by the bureaucratic caste, and not enough time is set aside for the membership to address their concerns. There is resistance to developing a broader political understanding. The provincial and federal conventions of the NDP are therefore not a place for the um, 
leadership to listen to the concerns of the membership in the constituencies, but a place to put their agenda across and to avoid any socialist resolutions that they do not like. The best we do is to speak to constituents in our EDAs, put forward significant resolutions and hope to mobilize the membership around these crucial resolutions. In the process, we make workers aware that the system is set against us and offer the alternative of revolutionary socialism. As this is the best party we have to work with, it is good to be realistic in this endeavor and to educate each other about the process and obstacles we face. During the process, we may build our own membership and also an informed membership in the NDP and put forward a class struggle perspective. There isn't an alternative party of the working class at this time, so this is the best way forward. We have been involved in this work for decades and we are gaining essential skills as revolutionaries and at times are moving sections of the NDP to the left and punch above our weight as we go. This is all laid out in our tasks and perspective documents and it is through democratic centralized, centralism and a party program that we move ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Now we will go back to Gary for the conclusion of his presentation. Go ahead, Gary. Unmute yourself, comrade. Okay. So I was talking about centralism and then I wanted to move into, uh, or sorry, of, uh, not centralism, but of a monolithic interpretation of centralism. Now I want to talk about ultra democracy. The tendency to correct the problems of over centralism through ultra democracy is just as destructive as the former. Ultra democracy res responds to uneven development by negating the role of leadership and tries to prevent arbitrary decision making by attempting to arrive at a consensus on every issue. In its insistence on unanimity, ultra-democracy shares a basic assumption with the opponents of monolithic unity. Ultra-democracy fails on several counts. Democracy is not primarily a form of free speech, but a decision-making mechanism. Ultra-democratic organizations often, often find it difficult to make any decisions at all, thus actually frustrating majority rule. <laughs> when leadership is not fully acknowledged, it operates unofficially and informally, but it always exists, so that the members have no effective way to hold it responsible for the most part, ultra-democratic organizations turn out to be neither effective nor democratic. <laughs> the question of tendencies of action. Principles of democratic centralism apply the right of minorities to raise their views in a constructive manner. This means that members with minority views should have the chance to meet together and communicate with each other in developing those views to present to the organization. Without this foundation of organizational democracy, leadership would have a monopoly on presenting information, proposals, and evaluations. The absence of serious alternatives would cripple the organization's ability to evaluate or decline, rectify errors, or hold leadership accountable. <clears throat> There can, of course, be no permanent special interest of a tendency separate from the purpose of the Marxist-Leninist organization itself. Because the party reflects the interests of the class as a whole. Contradictions, however, contradictions within the working class as a whole are necessarily reflected in the party and it is thus both legitimate and inevitable. <clears throat> we apply the term tendency 
to those formations that seek to struggle within the organization for a change of political line, practice, or leadership. Although tendencies must be able to organize to be able to carry on their side of the debate within the party, their members continue to work under the discipline of the organization and of overall unity with it. Similarly, there may be times, there may at times be a need for separate caucuses of racial and national minority members, women and gay people and other groups. These formations may be needed for two reasons. They allow the specially oppressed members to struggle more effectively against the pressures from bourgeois society that might lead the organization to drop or self pedal their particular demands. Demands that are crucial to the long-term unity of the working class. <clears throat> Second, these caucuses can further fight against persistent reassertion of racist, and sexist, and heterosexist ideology within the organization. On the other hand, factions are groupings that have fundamental differences with the organization's political line, and which have the, their own organizational discipline, apart from that above that of the organization as a whole. <clears throat> Clearly the continued existence of such parallel leading centers undermines the organization's unity of action and degrades its decision-making process. In such a case, the organization's leadership <laughs> must take the initiative to address the issues dividing the organization. <clears throat> Striving to resolve the differences and preserve the unity of the organization, or to split the organization in as principled a manner as possible. It will be difficult to pra practice to judge when a tendency is strengthening the organization when it is becoming a permanent competing center or special interest group. Since these formations will often be cr critical leadership, leader leaders may react defensively and see them as annoying and destructive. Key to the correct conclusion of these struggles will be a leadership able to act and to see itself acting on behalf of the whole organization and informed and dependent an independent cadre that is membership who are not afraid to listen to criticism of the leadership and who are able to judge whether the criticism is right or wrong. The base between tendencies must be based on a desire to build the entire organization with a commitment to united action once the decisions be made. It is this struggle that distinguishes a healthy struggle uh, from a destructive one that descends into factional intrigue. A sectarian attitude of smashing the opposition through distortion or bureaucratic manipulation prevents objective examination of different political lines and to make united action more, more difficult to achieve. <coughs> Democratic centralism in today's movement. In any period, the synthesis of democracy and centralism depends on several factors. The level of development of revolutionary socialists, the nature of their tasks and their relationship to the masses, set in the context of the state of the class struggle, the development of mass movements, their level of consciousness, etc. Since all these elements can change rapidly, revolutionary socialists must be able to quickly alter not only the organization's strategy and tactics, but also their organizational forms and practices. The revolutionary socialist movement has usually endorsed this concept. <coughs> but in practice, revolutionary socialist organizations have often been structurally static. As those that were, there was one abstract model of revolutionary socialist organization, that was always appropriate. For ultra-left groups, the organizational model has often been highly centralized, semi-military, based on their fantasy that the revolution is always just around the corner. A highly bureaucratic centralized form also suits revisionist and reformist organizations because it gives the leadership ample means to stifle militant pressures from the base, something that Helen was just talking about. <clears throat> Lenin, it's interesting to look at the flexibility of Lenin. 
uh, in the, in the, what is to be done, Lenin argued that only a tightly knit party of professional revolutionaries led by a semi-secret leadership could evade the Tsarist police and organize among the working class. Yet a few years later, during the revolution of 1905, Lenin argued for opening up the party to the influence of the masses to bring in the revolutionary workers. Party machinery created for survival and the slow task of bringing revolutionary consciousness was now too conservative, too slow. Different circumstances called for different practice of democratic centralism. How should we apply democratic centralism today? I think these factors are central. The revolutionary socialist left in Canada is small and immature and lacks political unity forged in struggle. Uh, it consists, it instead consists of inexperienced, relatively recent new members who have not been through large mass upsurges. There's also a handful of older experienced comrades who have seen a few mass struggles, tendency struggles, and faction fights. The main task of the movement is therefore to develop a general line that can unite it and guide it towards greater political effectiveness among the masses. This general line will be the result of political struggle based on serious theoretical and mass work. We face many problems in accomplishing this task, however. Both members and leaders of our movement are at a relatively low level if you consider where Trotsky and Lenin were in the leadership of the Russian Revolution. <clears throat> the movement itself is quite small, even within a relatively small revolutionary left. The movement is thus isolated from the vast majority of the working people. We're the only ones, however, who work in the NDP and the trade unions and take them seriously, and we're doing everything we can be in contact with it, to integrate ourselves as rapidly as possible into the mass movement. But we have to <clears throat> admit that we are uh, still small and our connections are as much as we can make them, but still weak. The political situation in Canada today is relatively stable. Bourgeois political democracy is the dominant political form. In light of these factors, I think that for the foreseeable future, our primary emphasis should be on the democratic aspects of democratic centrism. Unity in action and organizational efficiently, efficiency should be developed- yeah, five within, minutes. Okay, I'll be finished in two. Should be developed within the context of the primacy of democracy, freedom of discussion, frequent reevaluation and full circulation of information. <coughs> This method of organizational practice will give our movement the maximum opportunity to develop its politics further. Substantially increasing the degree of centralization of the authority of leadership can only stunt our political growth unless it is based on a solid foundation of unity around a scientific general line widely understood and widely accepted. Instead of rushing to centralize the movement, which I'm not proposing that we're doing, we must work to build the basis for a healthy centralism. Our movement must consciously develop its leadership and cadre. We must recognize that leadership abilities do not come from playing roles or assuming organizational titles. The theoretical and practical leadership that we must need, that we need, must grow through struggle as comrades develop their political abilities and become respected for their work. Further, leaders must play an active educational role. To do this, they must lead by example by fostering criticism and being able, uh, capable of self-criticism on all levels, and by instituting organizational-wide programs for political development and for learning practical skills. In addition, since young and inexperienced organizations are bound to make many mistakes, the ability of leaders to take responsibility for them openly and learn from them is particularly important in this period. <clears throat> As I hope you have concluded, democratic centralism it's not a set of procedures or protocols or the perfect constitution. It is, it is at its best, it is a way of operating in a revolutionary organization with a high level of theoretical development and considerable experience in the working class and anti-imperialist struggle. This combination leads to a self-confident leadership and a membership that knows how to make the leadership accountable. We are not there yet, but we are on our way. We certainly are.
Thank you very much, Gary. Okay, so we're going to open the floor now for Q&A and each person will get three minutes to make an intervention or ask a question and, and the panel will get three minutes each to answer any question they okay. wish to answer. So I'm, I'm waiting to see some hands go up. Uh, yes, may I chime in? Can you hear me just yes, fine? Yes, you can. Y yes, Gage. Yes, go ahead. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so I have several questions, and I'll do my best to catch them as much as I can. I forget which one which one of you talked about which one. Um, so the first things first, the um, confirmation of Lenin's, Lenin's uh, belief and critique on terrorist fetishization. Um, do you guys see an equivalent between that and the movement of far-right mass shootings going on and their understanding of lone wolves? And the confirmation of Lenin's theory around that fetishization of, of terrorization. Um, do you think there's an equivalence between the Mensheviks, I believe the middle class part of the Russian Revolution, and the moderates discussed by Martin Luther King Jr.? And um, oh, uh, where was my third one? Um, and are there ways to combat the disempowerment of the minority in the modern day? And do you think that the disempowerment of the modern um, of the minority in the modern day has much to do with the dis disempowerment of the uh, every man, quote unquote, in the modern day as well? <laughs> I hope okay. I said that was quite clear. <laughs> That's okay. You were within your three minutes. Thank you, Gage. Okay, Gary, yeah. I'll start with you and then Helen. <clears throat> I'm not really sure I understood all of that, but in any case, um, the Menshevik. Sorry, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say the Menshevik. What, what, what exactly were the Menshevists? They were the middle class of Russia, right? No. no? Um, okay. No, I don't see it that way. Mensheviks, the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks were both <clears throat> socialist organizations with different theories about how the revolution would unfold. Uh, okay, I misunderstood your statement. That's on me. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gage. So, uh, Gary, uh, any, you want to add something? Go ahead. You have your three uh, minutes to yeah, say what you I, wish. I said, yeah, it wasn't a wasn't so much a class difference as a class orientation difference. <clears throat> okay. The Mensheviks thought the bourgeoisie would have a period, as in the Western part of Europe, where they would carry out the conquest of feudalism and the introduction of uh, capitalist property relations and capitalist uh, uh, production. Trotsky, okay, said, okay. Trotsky said, no, the bourgeoisie is too weak in these kinds of countries and they won't be able to carry it through because on the one hand, you've got a powerful working class already and they're fearful of that working class. So they'll hesitate and they'll, be, they'll constantly look to ally themselves with the old feudal aristocracy. So uh, Trotsky proved to be completely correct. Okay, okay. Okay, Th thank, thank you. Thank you, you did it. For me. Thank you both. Ellen, you wish to weigh in on this? Yes, thank you very much. And um, thank you, Gage. Yes, uh, Lenin on terrorism. You know, the far right in the United States with their mass shootings and all that um, is, is totally disgraceful. And um, as a strategy, this thing about you know the the glamorization of terrorism amongst far right groups um, uh, is something that we 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 need to have a, a good critique of, and um, so some people on the uh, I guess you'd call it the left, the anarchists, for instance, also um, uh, glamorize uh, individual acts um, against the state. Um, not uh, thinking through their actions and realizing that when these things occur, all it does is increase the amount of policing that goes on of these groups and of society in general. It brings a larger police force out, laws to crack down on, on these kinds of actions, and they eventually they start to affect everybody. And it's a, a very negative development. And um, we have a critique as Marxists of that. And um, we uh, don't support, you know, we have to watch out. There are agents provocateurs, agents of the state 
who infiltrate organizations and try to get them to do acts of terrorism in order to arrest them, right? So that's, we're mm -hmm. very strongly against um, agent provocateurs in our movement, um, but you're right, in the far right, they're mostly the people who are responsible for these acts of terrorism that are going on today. Um, mm -hmm. The dis Thank you. Um, excuse me, excuse me, sorry, Alan. You just get to ask your question, Gage, then you listen to the answer and we move on to, to somebody else who's waiting. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very okay. much. I appreciate you're your You're quite welcome. Answer. You're quite welcome. Go ahead, Alan. Um, the disempowerment of uh, the minority today, I'm not quite sure which minorities you're referring to. Um, could you give an example, please, Gage? Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Uh, for example, the disempowerments of the trans community currently going on in the modern dialogue and how they can't get any unity to help them going along. Even over three days into June, I have heard very little from groups on their opinions of the trans genocide that's going on. Right. And, and how does that impact us? Because I feel like there's a common class that sees the one man already or the other some kind of question that will a reflection of their own rights being taken away by that person being persecuted. Um, and I want to know, does that impact the disempowerment of the common man to feel like they cannot act on behalf of themselves or others. Yes. Okay, thank you, Gage. Thank Continue, you, Gage. Helen, and we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the disempowerment of the trans community today, you'll notice that they don't get the right to reply and to speak when there are acts of violence against them, that the disproportionate amount of attention goes to the people who are anti-trans. And that shows you the way in which in our society, the power structure is organized. So for instance, people like Jordan Peterson will get lots of airtime on the trans issue. Um, but um, the trans people themselves have been disempowered in the process. And that's because we don't live in a society with democratic centralism <laughs> at all, right? We live in a top-down society where the views of the elite um, are permeated right through the structure of society. And that goes even into some aspects of the media um, and other areas of society. And we're- 30 seconds. Sorry, we're not we're not hearing their voices. Thank you very much for those thoughtful questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a list, uh, which is one is in the chat. I'll get to it uh, in a second. Yes. So the next one will be flow from flow, which I will read from the chat. Then it's Barry. Then it's Julius. Okay. So the next question to go to the panel is this. What happens when there is not principled application of democratic centralism within movements? Can you think of any illustrative recent examples? We'll start with Ellen and then Gary. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think, you know, is something that we, democratic centralism is something that is really only spoken about by those of us on the Leninist left. Um, we, we work in uh, social movements as best we can, and there are times when um, discussion is closed down before um, we've had our chance to uh, voice ourselves. This links up with Gage's question about the disempowerment of the minority. So that even when we're working um, in United Fronts, hopefully if we're in a United Front, we've got democratic centralism, but not all, um, not all the people who are, should be our friends and allies are educated about the principle of democratic centralism. So it's our job is to bring that about, to discuss it and to talk about it openly um, uh, um, with them and to understand that it's simply because it isn't a sort of current thing in society to understand the principles of democratic centralism. In the NDP, that would be a, a prime uh, example of a place where we need to um, uh, educate the membership about democratic centralism so that they can insist on achieving that um, when they're at meetings at all levels. Thank you. 
Gary? Well, there are a lot of small left groups too that misinterpret it. As I was talking about, the uh, ultra left <clears throat> tend to go for centralism because they believe the revolution is always just around the corner. They don't make any realistic assessment of the current conditions and the low level of class consciousness of the Canadian working class. Um, not that that can't change rapidly, but it will take some time. I mean, even in Russia, <clears throat> it took from February to October. Uh, it took a 1905 revolution that failed, many lessons were learned, and then it took from February to October in order for the working class to pair itself the fall of the Leninists to power. So uh, <clears throat> just thinking it's around the corner and not quite understanding how these mass movements work lead to that kind of, uh, so that, that happens a lot. Stalinist organizations reports to operate by democratic centralism. They uh, do the kind of, of uh, what I was talking about, over-centralization. There isn't really a democratic discussion, or if there is, it's usually on, on side topics, not the main line. They're fundamentally referenced. That, that issue, that fundamental issue never comes up. They'll discuss uh, how, how best to be a referenced, I guess. But once it's all adopted, it's, uh, it's uh, there's no further, there's no, criti no real criticism of the leadership. There's no opportunity for criticism of the leadership. And uh, so that's another example. Uh, I just want to say on the question of uh, of trans people and so on, they're simply objectified. The, the right wingers attack them physically, denounce them through the ruling class owned press, and they never given a chance to speak. So they're just objects to be brutalized and criticized. And that's something that we want to take up. I think we can, we're going to have to look at doing a bit more to give voice to the uh, victims of this kind of oppression. Okay, thank you. So we'll go now to Barry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And, and thanks to the presenters. I thought that the two uh, presentations, although Gary's was bifurcated into two parts, uh, were um, very complementary and covered the ground uh, very, very well. Um, and the, the salient point, which I think both uh, Helen and uh, Gary made, is that democratic centralism is about leadership accountability. I think that is so fundamental. I'm going to come back to that in, in, in a moment. There's, there's an old expression, semi-humorous expression, that you, may be, uh, that you may recognize. When everyone thinks alike, nobody thinks much. <laughs> this, this, this describes an organization where um, the priority is to think like your neighbor or like your comrade or like your uh, fellow member, rather than have the courage to present a different point of view within the overall program and strategy of the organization to be critical. So lack of criticism makes for a boring organization, but it also makes for an organization which is insensible to the prevailing conditions. Uh, it, it, you know, instead of criticism, you have flattery. And that doesn't move the struggle forward. In fact, that is the basis for bureaucratism. Well, I'm gonna flatter the person in authority because that'll help me uh, rise uh, to the top of the pyramid. So criticism is vital. <laughs> It's, it, it's not a luxury, it's extremely important. But as democratic centralists, we argue that criticism is most important inside the party, not outside and against the party. Because um, that only encourages opponents who don't stand on principled arguments necessarily, who want to amplify criticism of the party that they disdain. Uh, we we kind of like our party because we think its principles are good. Uh, and, and we think the criticism should occur inside of it. Uh, and, and that's where it can do the most good because it's, it, it's an argument made in front of politically uh, aware people who will put the criticism to the test and who put it to good use. Now, I wanna contrast the Democratic Centralist Workers' Party with what characterizes the NDP and the unions, the major working class organizations in Canada. There the rule is, and the two presenters made this abundantly clear, top-down rule. It's a top-down organization, the, the NDP and the unions. Um, 
you know, it's ironic that many, you know, semi-educated social democrats will say that Leninists are undemocratic. It's 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 very curious indeed because the fact is the social democrats are profoundly democratic. And I could give you an endless stream of examples. Um, they select the candidates, and now they vested the power in the uh, federal uh, uh, campaign director to pick and choose the candidates to decide, regardless what the local membership may want and may may uh, express as their choice. Uh, the uh, you know um, what's her name and uh, the, the the federal director. Uh, is the one who who has the decisive say. Um, they they say that the Leninists are undemocratic, but in fact, compared to them, we make a fetish of democracy because we insist that all points of view must be heard, and we welcome the different points of view, unless of course they're racist, sexist, homophobic, anti-socialist. We have no thirty place. seconds. Um, I'm going to show you what the the union leadership. It was a CLC convention recently in Montreal, and they adopted the title Action Plans. There's only one small problem with the action plans. There's no action. It's a lobbying of corporations and government. And when delegates point that out, they're given short shrift. Uh, we say that we need more time for discussion because we're committed to democracy. So you see, democratic centralism is about leadership accountability, and we're trying to spread this good word in the mass mm -hmm. workers' organizations. But whether we succeed or not, we practice it inside the revolutionary socialist oh. workers' organization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comrades, I don't know if there was a question in there or no, but I'll leave it to you, Gary, to... Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. No, There's your I question. Think, I think that was a comment, and I agree with every single word of it. Okay. All right. Ellen, how do you feel? <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, yeah, it brought to mind some things about nobody thinking much when there's no criticism when the party, the NDP, of course, first came to my mind immediately when you said that, and that democratic centralism is about leadership accountability. This is so true, right? I went, the, um, I went to the BC Provincial Council of the NDP, and I um, I was uh, went as an observer because our delegate was our president, which was good. And um, I took notes. And for me, the whole meeting was actually about the interventions that were being made from the floor that were insisting on more democracy. Each one, whether it be a complaint about parachute candidates who didn't do their work in a constituency, um, and it would have been better if, you know, if we had had uh, local candidates known to the membership to go forward. This is the sort of thing that was brought up from the floor of the convention. And um, at various points, things were ruled out of order. Um, the chair ruled it out of order and there had to be other people come up and speak. There were amendments to things. It was going on and on. It was very good. And so my report just basically consisted of listing all of the interventions made from the floor. And um, th this is the way it is when you're in an organization that is not operating under democratic centralism. The criticism doesn't get taken up. You, you, you can, if you're lucky, you can get to a microphone, you can express yourself, but you, when you put forward a resolution, the assumption is it'll be defeated straight away, right? We're getting used to that, but we're also getting more skillful at presenting our resolutions in ways that the membership on the floor of the convention or whatever um, will listen. And sometimes we're lucky enough things will get through. And um, that happened. We had a resolution. It was a, a watered down resolution about climate change, but we got it. And Stephen Crozier made an intervention to make it um, a bit more exact and a little more forceful. Um, but that's about, the that's about the best we get right now. We really need to push the democratic centralism in the NDP and to make it so that it's, people do think where it's not, not just an organization where people are coerced into keeping quiet and doing the come by our kind of thing. Thank you. Okay. Can I, can Thank I you. just... On second thought. Just 30 seconds. <laughs> Go ahead, you know, Gary. Also, in that provincial council meeting, Stephen and his wife, 
uh, use the time uh, when the leadership was speaking, which is almost all the time. Uh, it's hard to be accountable when you don't shut up. <laughs> anyway, he and his wife got a list of about 25 people at the council who were interested. These are people on the council who are interested in, in forming a group to fight for democracy at the NDP. And this is a very important step for the Socialist Caucus who are quite willing to work with these people to the extent that they will work with us. And I'm sure many of them will uh, because it puts, us, puts the fight right in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the sphere. And there's about 140 or 150 people in this provincial council meeting. These are the main activists in the BC NDP. And it puts us right at the heart of that group fighting for democracy against the group, the cabal that actually uh, currently runs the party. Okay, Gary. Okay, we're going to move to Julius, and then we have some questions in the chat as well. Julius? Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much um, for the presentations. I do have a, a comment and a, a question. So, I mean, I understand why we adhere to democratic centralism within our party, within socialist action. And I hear the comments and concerns that we're hearing about the lack of democracy in the NDP. And we fight for democracy in the NDP and within uh, the labor movement because it's severely lacking in both. However, um, I still have a hard time understanding why we would actually promote the use of democratic centralism within either of those organizations, because frankly, it would prevent us from criticizing the misleadership of them from the outside. Um, that is a, a key part of what democratic centralism is from what I can see. So we push for democracy and democratic reforms in those bodies, but I don't think that we necessarily want to have uh, adhere to democratic centralism when it's centered by the leadership of the NDP. Uh, the NDP is the Labour Party we work in, but it's not our it's not our party. It's a social democratic party with limitations uh, that are inherent. And until we win the leadership, if that were to ever happen, and I think that most of us don't necessarily think that that would ever happen within the NDP, uh, I, I don't understand why we would want to have democratic centralism within the NDP or the labor movement for the same reasons we we would not be able to criticize those organizations from the outside if that was something that existed. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm getting this wrong, uh, but I just wanted some clarification on that. Okay, we'll go to Gary and then Ellen. Well, I think you have a point for sure. Um, workers uh, impose elements of democratic centralism for example, you don't go around criticizing a union on strike and you don't cross a picket line. So those are, uh, they demand unity, uh, at least in the face of the boss. But even in then, I mean, uh, the rank and file have to have the chance to criticize the leadership for caving in and selling out. And, uh, and you have to be able to do it publicly. So there's only limited applications of certain forms of centralism that are, that are valid to push for. But we would push for unity against the boss. That's that's for sure. Uh, but I wouldn't call it democratic centralism. I think democratic centralism is uh, requires a much greater degree of of, cons of agreement on concept, goals, and an understanding and an analysis of society and all these things that our democratic centralism is based on. Is our entire Marxist-Leninist analysis and program. So. Uh, yeah, but you know there are elements of it that we can we can see, and I think okay, that's yeah. true both in the NDP and the uh, and the uh, and the trade unions. Okay, Helen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julius. I understand your point, but I think the thing is we we're, we're not. To, I wouldn't think we would promote democratic centralism like in those terms to the leadership, right? I'm not talking about that, but the principles of democratic so, so, uh, centralism, um, we could promote amongst the membership that we're working with, that they should insist on full disclosure of documents um, and uh, at meetings, um, full discussion of the documents and a voting on them in a way that we understand to be part of democratic centralism. 
um, and, and promoted amongst the, the membership, both in the NDP and the labor movement. I don't see any problems with doing f f in that way, right? Um, but I don't think we'd announce to the leadership, you know, that we're, we're arguing for democratic centralism and we, we think the NDP should be democratic centralist or whatever. I think we'd be naive to think there would be any, any, anything but a hard crack down on us anyway, right? But I think amongst the membership in our day-to-day -day workings with them, the principles of democratic centralism should be um, something that we have forefront in our mind. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to go to the chat for the next one. I'm going to sort of put two questions into one, I do believe. And this is from Trevor, a popular leftist YouTuber, Luna Oi, or OI, I'm just pronouncing it Lunar I mentions in one of her videos that the downfall of the Soviet Union was attributable in part to a disintegration of enforcing democratic centralism. Gary and Ellen, would you both agree or disagree with that statement and why or why not? And then he was went it, on uh, to add another question, is democratic centralism practiced or has it been practiced in any modern existing worker state? deformed worker state or previously existing deformed water worker states, in particular China, uh, Vietnam, and the DPRK. So I'm putting these two questions together and I'll go to Gary and then to Ellen. <clears throat> Democratic centralism has never been practiced at the state level. Um, because there's, you know, like in the early Soviet Union, there was still a massive class struggle going on. Uh, the bourgeoisie was in rebellion uh, in, and there was a massive civil war uh, and there was a, a greater emphasis on centralism. For example, the Red Army was a military organization that operated in a highly centralized way. It did elect some officers and that sort of thing, uh, which was certainly something that didn't occur in the Tsarist army. But, you know, they had to follow orders because you can't have an army running off in all directions. <laughs> I know one time Trotsky got off the train uh, and he got on a horse and he, some red soldiers were retreating and he said, comrades, the enemy is that way and led them personally and got shot in both legs in that battle. Uh, so he was an example of, uh, of leadership, uh, taking the same risks as the soldiers and being a, and centralizing their orientation, you know, enforcing their discipline. But, um, uh, I, you know, in early stages of a transitional state, you can't call it a social state. You can call it a workers, a workers government. You can call it a transitional state, that sort of thing, where you have elements of a, of a workers state, and you have you're still fighting elements of bourgeois uh, bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. It's impossible to conceive of democratic centralism with that much dissension and disunity. And we really, uh, you know, then after that maybe one of the most advanced states that I would consider still a transitional state is uh, China. In China, you've got a problem of bureaucracy, and so you have excessive amounts of centralism. There is some element of democracy at the local level and the regional level, and people are elected, including people that are not in the Communist Party, but uh, they restrict it at the top. So uh, you're not getting, you know, they still have class struggle going on in China. I mean, you've got a powerful bourgeoisie. So, uh, so we're not, those are not situations where you can practice democratic centralism. Remember I said that you, there needs to be a great deal of unity on, on uh, methodology, on philosophy, on analysis, on program. It's all the basis for having effective uh, democratic centralism. Now, what was the other question? Oh, I got to go back to the chat. Oh, the uh, criticism. But, uh, the, Soviet, yeah, Soviet yes. Union failed. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, Soviet Union, uh, in the early days, well, the Soviet Union, the CPSU, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, was a democratic centralist party. There's no question about that. In the days of, of uh, in the days of the revolutionary upsurge, it was the highest example of a democratic centralist party, seething discussion and absolute unity, uh, and which is why I said it was such a mature party. I mean, the level of uh, a level of knowledge of the membership was very high 
and uh, they had a lot to say. And the leadership had to be accountable. There was a lot of people critical of Lenin and Trotsky, even while they led the revolution. So uh, yes, that was. Uh, uh, and did the CPSU later uh, <clears throat> fail to enforce centralism? On the contrary, that's all they enforced. Uh, there was no democracy. That was the problem. The, C the Stalinist leadership made terrible errors and ter terrible lurches in the wrong direction because they would not listen to the masses. They would not, there was no democratic input that flowed up through a rank and file of the CPSU working down there among the workers and peasants. Uh, they wouldn't listen to it. Therefore, they made beers and lurches and, uh, and uh, they were only interested in their own the preservation of their own caste. Uh, privileges in their own caste uh, enrichment. So uh, I don't agree with her criticism. Okay, uh, Helen? Um, yes, yeah, no, um, the Russian Revolution wasn't brought down by democratic centralism, right? <laughs> that, uh, under no circumstances it was brought down, as, as the writer was suggesting, someone mentioned. Um, but the, um, you know, the, uh, the Soviets, in the time of the, uh, the Russian Revolution, the Soviets, which are local councils, were set up and they were operating under almost warlike conditions, right? They were having to operate in secret. Um, they were, um, uh, they were uh, high, you know, uh, highly structured in some cases um, to deal with that situation. And um, the uh, use of the term democratic centralism was coined around 1917 in the revolution. So it was something that they were working on, but um, it's certainly democratic centralism didn't bring down the Russian revolution. We'll leave that to Stalin. Um, and, you know, there was a civil war after the revolution that they had to deal with. And um, uh, leadership um, was not um, under, under Stalin uh, changed uh, dramatically. And that was what brought down the Russian revolution. It wasn't uh, democratic centralism. And um, democratic centralism is a work in action. So, you know, there are countries that may be trying uh, to do it, like Cuba, for instance. Um, but... Uh, it's something more, more just that we find in the Leninist parties, my understanding, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I have one last question in the chat, but before I go to that, is there anybody that hasn't spoken would like to ask a question? Live question? Uh, or make a comment. With your camera on or off? No, anybody? Anybody before I go to the last question in the chat, I have a second uh, question they would like to ask. Somebody who's spoken before. Okay, so seeing none, I'm going to go to the final question then, and we'll just have a, a bit of a break between the, this session and the next, which probably we can all enjoy at this point in time. Okay, so it's an intervention with a question at the end, and it's from Trevor Cook. Final question. You mentioned that Lenin switched from believing in a secretive leadership to a more open democratic leadership. And this is this not the case because the RDSP existed legally or, or illegally, depending on a specific time period of its existence? Does the legality of free speech and political organization affect how democratic centralism be practiced. Here in Canada right now, we're allowed to have this meeting and organize freely, freely, albeit with the ever present possibility of state surveillance, such as when land defenders were spied on by Australian spy agencies contracted under CSIS a few years ago. I believe 2015 or 2016. Shortly after Trudeau was elected, Lenin, Trotsky, and all members in pre-revolutionary Russia, especially after the anarchist assassination of the Tsar, conducted their organizations illegal and engaged in technically criminal acts, such as taking on false identities and illegally crossing borders, holding meetings, transporting letters, etc. If it ever came to that here. How would we proceed? 
What effect would that have on the practice of democratic centralism in social action? Gary. Yeah, Lenin changed his mind. He didn't change his mind about democratic centralism. He observed a change in circumstances and then uh, used the principles of democratic centralism to alter the way the party operated. So he said, open the party up, bring in these revolutionary workers because they will, uh, will make us extremely sensitive to the mass movement and they will bring the mass movement into the party. So uh, that was a that was very good demonstration of how democratic centralism evolves with the mass movement and with the class consciousness of the mass movement. So uh, yeah, that was, uh, he wasn't saying, he, he, wasn't, he was right both times. You have to have more centralism and control in a period of repression than you do in a period of democracy. We're in a period of, as I said, of bourgeois democracy. And therefore we don't need as much centralism but we, uh, we could use the opportunity for more teaching and more democracy and more discussion and so on uh, to educate a cadre uh, as we grow. So uh, there was a second part to this question. Yes, uh, especially after oh, the anarchist system. I know he was asking, how would we operate in a period of that's right, that's right. Uh, we had one short one in 1970 when the War Measures Act came into existence, but it wasn't long enough for us to determine uh, to switch our whole nature of operating. Uh, we would have had to change if that had the War, War Measures Act had stayed in force. We would have had to start operating uh, or underground because. Uh, when the War Measures Act was declared, all of our members in Montreal, and the League Socialist Ouvrier, were arrested, dragged out of their beds in the middle of the night, and carted off to prison without right of lawyers or even being told why they were being dragged out. It was a pretty scary thing. And they were held there for days uh, before they were released. And it was well known that we were not part of the uh, of the uh, Front de Libération de Quebec terrorist actions involving a British diplomat and a cabinet minister in Quebec, in which one was murdered, the cabinet minister was murdered by the FLQ. Um, but, uh, we, you know, you, you're going to have to be clandestine, you're going to have to be centralized if you're going to actually try to operate under that kind of repression, where they can, uh, no, they don't need a warrant to search, they don't need uh, they don't need a charge to arrest you. They just arrest you, throw you in jail. And uh, uh, fortunately, it didn't reach the level of torture for our members. But uh, uh, yeah, we would have to see how it works. And we'd have to, it would be a completely new experience for us. We're just not experienced in doing that. Uh, but we would have to find a way to apply democratic censorship that allowed us to function under that kind of repression. Okay, Helen? Yes, uh, yes, we don't have the experience of that, fortunately, at the moment. So that's very good. Um, Trevor, your um, your comment um, is important. Trotsky mentioned that the context is all important to the level of democratic centralism, how it's conducted, um, whether it's secret or open, etc. And um, that we should always think always think about the context, as you mentioned, the encirclement by enemies and things like that. Uh, we're we're relatively quite lucky right now with the way we're doing it. The RDSP, as you mentioned, was uh, illegal at a certain point, and um, uh, our access to free speech differs um, a great deal. That links back to um, the previous comments about um, my, you know. Um, emboldening, uh, empowering minorities and all that, we're seeing, you know, that there isn't, we don't have absolute free speech by any means, because we don't ha all have access to the organs of speech, such as the media, etc. other other people like that. Um, and during, um, we have had some experience, you know, during the big postal workers strike, um, the War Measures Act, etc. people, um, the times like that are used to round up people on the left who have very little contact, if any way, in any, with the actual supposed threat 
that was going on under the War Measures Act. People on the left were, were rounded up during the big postal workers strikes. Um, pe people on the left were some people, I met one man who um, was out fishing, you know, during the postal workers strike. And when he got back, he was arrested. And um, he hadn't been involved in any activity at all. Um, so it's it's can be quite random like that. But um, those are different times than we live in right now. But um, um, I'm sure there are, there are people, and certainly in other countries, who have experienced these things, and um, uh, hopefully would be able to uh, help us out. Thank you very much. Just a couple of comments, if I can. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> One, this is an example. The War Measures Act was an example of how terrorism brings down repression on the whole left um, and takes away our rights and, and, and uh, impairs our ability to communicate with the working class and other oppressed groups. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, that was a byproduct of acts of terrorism that uh, accomplished nothing. I mean, apart from one dead cabinet minister, and I guess that's a goal or a gain, but uh, it, it, but not at the cost of repressing the entire left. That's the first comment. The second comment is we prefer to operate openly because we reach the workers and other oppressed people in Canada way easier. So we would prefer to operate dem openly, democratically, legally uh, where we can. But we don't get to decide that. The ruling class gets to decide that. But we fight for democratic rights. Those democratic rights help us and the working class to organize themselves and defend themselves. So we prefer open, legal, democratic uh, functioning. Just to just to be clear on that. Okay, comrades. Okay, Barry. One last one last question, and, and then we're we're closing down. Go ahead. I notice we have a bit of time, and I think it's worth considering this question, which is uh, pregnant in the replies uh, by the two presenters just on the last round. Why does state repression occur when it does? I mean, it's not constant. It varies from time to time based on circumstances and based on the class relationship of forces. Um, uh, Pierre Vallier wrote a book in which he said, in fact, uh, he had reasons to suspect, and he provided like 300 pages of uh, his own evidence that uh, the, the RCMP infiltrated the FLQ and precipitated some, if not all of the uh, acts uh, terrorists that were ascribed to the FLQ. Why, why did they do that? Uh, why did we have a War Measures Act, not just in, 19, in October, 1970, but also at the time of um, opposition to conscription in Quebec, particularly, uh, during Second World War and prior and, and during the First World War. Why, why does the ruling class unleash repression? And it has to do not with a response to certain acts by an aggrieved um, a section of the working class. It has to do with the overall relationship of class forces. Uh, when, the, when the ruling class thinks it can benefit by an act of intimidation, and to be quite frank, the War Measures Act and October 1970, it had the opposite impact. It, it furthered Quebec nationalism uh, exponentially, and it even stimulated indigenous people's um, uh, uh, struggles and, uh, and mobilizations. But why do they do it when they do it? It's about the relationship of forces. And if, you know, if, if Gary and, and Helen want to elaborate more on this theme, I think it's useful because related to it is the idea that fascism is around the corner. Okay, the revolution is not around the corner, but is fascism around the corner? Is, is in, an extremely authoritarian state? This doesn't make sense unless society is, 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 is um, paralyzed by a level of working class insurgency. And that's yeah. not yet happened. It will happen. Um, hopefully most of us will get to see that and the response of the working class that continues the fight for democracy and transforms it into a fight for Majority rule, work, a workers' government. There you Thank have you, it. <laughs> okay, Helen, and then Gary, if you wish to answer. Hold on. Okay, yeah, got that. Yeah, good points, Barry. Um, you know, I think they, the main reason they unleash their oppression is to stifle the population, to fill them full of fear, 
so that they won't step out. So they, they find scapegoats. Um, the scapegoats might be members of the left, it might be trade unionists, it might be um, members even of the NDP, right? Um, and they'll use that fear to stop people from joining together and organizing to um, uh, bring about something more democratic. Um, and so it varies in time and place depending on the agenda that the ruling class have and what kind of a shock doctrine they want to, uh, to bring about is to, um, uh, uh, in order to do that. And sometimes they, um, they put in agent provocateurs into organizations so that they, have, they can have the semblance of doing it for a reason um, when they're the reason that it happened in the first place. And um, we have to look out for that at all times, you know, and um, we need to learn from things like the, what happened during the War Measures Act and uh, conscription in Quebec and all the rest of that and um, move from that. I don't have much more to say on that. Thank you for the question though. Okay, Gary. Um, well, I agree with Barry that the uh, ruling class fascism and, and this kind of action are, are quite different. Fascism is a mass movement. It's a, it's a last ditch defense against the rising working class. Uh, and so unless you see the working class in motion, coming down and with fascism is unlikely. Uh, what you'll see is, is intimidation. You see uh, small, I guess, fascistic type gangs that uh, beat up people and that sort of thing. But full, full, full blown fascism is a mass movement. So um, th this kind of government repression, as has been said, is uh, an effort to teach the great fear and to, and to uh, teach the so, working class that they can do this at any time. Uh, they can call out the army as they did in the, in the uh, War Measures Act. And the most recent one, is uh, the convoy stuff where they did the uh, emergency act, uh, Trudeau used the emergency act. They had a bit of a, a bit more of a problem. That was kind of a complex one because it wasn't a left-wing group, it's a right-wing movement. Um, but uh, it was, uh, the, you know, they were under increasing pressure from the people of Ottawa to get these people out of here and let them get up with their lives. Um, and the police would not enforce the law. So uh, they did, they, instead of uh, uh, taking the steps to get the police to enforce the law and move these people out of the streets and blocking the streets and uh, that sort of thing and letting society continue, uh, they used the Emergency Act because uh, they, they use it as an opportunity to demonstrate this. The Emergency Act is a piece of, is an act succeeding the War Measures Act. War Measures Act was replaced by the Emergency Act. I'm not quite sure what the difference is, uh, but it appears to be not much. Um, so uh, that was a slightly different thing. But uh, yeah, fascism is a mass movement. And this is just state repression. And Canada so far has been very brief periods just to show us the, the uh, sharpened teeth of the state give us a reminder that, that, is, that the state does have sharp teeth. Okay, so one last question for you both. It's from Kerry. How would democracy centralism work when working class refuse to participate due to political oppression? Gary and then Helen. Well, democratic centralism is a party or organizational concept. So it always works. Uh, you, you, you moderate the uh, extent of democracy and the extent of centralism, depending on your circumstances. But, you know, if the working class uh, isn't participating, the working class isn't participating. I mean, we just have to continue to work to issue propaganda and agitation and education of the working class and, and come forward with specific recommendations and specific struggles and organize as best we can. But the working class, we don't determine when the working class will start to act. That's determined by great contradictions in capitalism and, and circumstances that force the workers to move. Nobody moves into a revolution uh, because they've got nothing better to do. They move into it because they have to. Uh, 
so that when that happens, we, we, have, we just have to be ready. We have to be as ready as we can. And this is an example of the German Revolution in the 1920s, 21-23. German Spartacus movement, the revolutionary socialists, weren't ready. They were still a small organization. And they did the best they could, but they could not lead it. And it was ultimately defeated. And the Social Democrats had, had the communist leadership murdered, literally murdered, uh, by right-wing uh, Freikorps, which was a proto-Nazi type of military structure that the Social Democrats worked hand in hand with. And, and, and even though the Communist Party wasn't that big and powerful and played a, sec a secondary role in the upsurge, they killed them all anyway, because they knew that they were truly state enemies, enemies of the state. Anyway, as I say, the workers do too. Workers Move when they have when they are crippled to it. just have to respond. But again, there's democratic centralism is a party a party uh, political practice. It's not uh, not something workers. If they don't follow us, they don't follow us. Okay, Helen. I agree. I agree with what Gary has said. Um, if the working class uh, refuse to participate in democratic centralism due to oppression, we, we don't have democratic centralism at that point, but we have to find some other way to work. Thank you. Okay, and thank you to you both. It was a wonderful presentation from both of you. And, and thank you to all of our participants who put the great questions in. So uh, we have a break now, and I'd like to see everybody return at 7 p.m. sharp. And the title of the next panel will be the transitional program, how to win and how to work in the NDP and unions. And our speakers will be Barry Wiseletter, Julia Zarscott, and Florentia Shade. So see you all back at 7 p.m. sharp. Thanks, comrades. Welcome back to our third and final session of the Socialist Action Spring Education Conference 2023. This conference can also be viewed at a later time on the SA YouTube channel. Okay, so the, the panel tonight is called the Transitional Program, How to Win and How to Work in the NDP and Unions. Our speakers will be Barry Weiserletter, uh, Florentia Shade, and Julius R. Scott. So we'll start first with Barry, who is a writer, editor, and union organizer. He is the federal secretary of Socialist Action, chair of the NDP caucus, and he resides in Toronto. Welcome, Barry. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, comrades and friends. Without a clear program of demands, it is impossible for any contending social class to achieve its goals. The question is, what kind of political program is necessary for the majority class, the working class, to identify its goals and to actually win them. Originally published in the Bulletin of the Opposition in 1938, The Death Agony of Capitalism and the Tasks of the Fourth International, more popularly known as the Transitional Program, was adopted as the political platform of the Trotskyist Fourth International at its founding Congress in 1938. Along with Lenin's What is to be Done, and left-wing communism and infantile disorder, the transitional program remains one of the most important works of revolutionary strategy ever written. It is essential reading for revolutionaries today. Following the Russian Revolution of 1917, the world witnessed a wave of revolutionary movements across Europe and beyond. Inspired by the victory of the workers in Russia and the founding of the Communist International, the working class arose in Germany, Hungary, Italy, China, and Spain. Almost every European nation was in a state of revolutionary ferment. However, instead of the di dictatorship of the proletariat and socialism, the tumultuous period of the 1920s and 1930s gave rise to fascism, Stalin's purges, and the descent of the world into a war which threatened horror and destruction on a scale without precedent. It was in this dark context that Trotsky set out to write his program for the revolutionary socialists of the world. The first task of Marxists in this period was to understand and explain these defeats so that future movements would not repeat the same mistakes. It is this task which Trotsky undertakes in the first part of the transitional program. 
He distilled all the huge events and harsh lessons of this period into the opening line, quote, the world political situation as a whole is chiefly characterized by an, an historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat, close quote. Crisis of leadership. The objective prerequisites for revolution were not absent, according to Trotsky. Conditions, quote, have not only ripened, they have begun to get somewhat rotten, close quote. What did, what did that mean? It meant that the delay in revolution would cause more dire conditions and worse prospects. The main problem was the inadequacy of the leadership of the working class. The official leaders acted as a break on the world revolution. The key task of the Fourth International was therefore to develop and strengthen this subjective factor, leadership. The question of how this could be achieved, the principles and tactics required of a revolutionary Marxist organization, that is to what the rest of the transitional program is devoted, transitional demands. Predicting that the coming world war would usher in a new period of revolutionary upheavals, Trotsky stressed the need to overcome, quote, the contradiction between the maturity of the objective uh, conditions, revolutionary conditions, and the immaturity of the proletariat and its vanguard, close quote, caused by the exhaustion and demoralization of the older generation and the inexperience of the younger one. To this end, Trotsky raised the need uh, for Marxists to, quote, help the masses in the process of the daily struggle to find the bridge between present demands and the socialist program of the revolution, close quote, including the use of what he calls transitional demands. Why transitional? Because they begin with the demands and consciousness present today and conclude with the conquest of power by the working class. Trotsky distinguishes these transitional demands from the old minimum program of the social democratic parties. The reformists, the social democrats, really offered two programs, a minimum program and a maximum program. The maximum program was usually reserved for Sunday picnic speeches. The reformist minimum program was simply a list of partial demands to be sought on the basis of the existing capitalist system. The goal of socialism was presented by the reformists as a distant, abstract prospect. Transitional demands, on the other hand, raise concrete tasks necessary for the working class and oppressed sectors of society, consisting of demands which cannot be achieved without workers gaining state power. The transitional demands are advanced precisely in order to demonstrate, in practice, the need for revolutionary answers to the problems of the vast majority. In short, the purpose of the transitional program is to concretize the tasks of the socialist revolution in a way which matches the experience of workers in struggle. Another way to express this is the construction of a bridge, a bridge that links the present consciousness of the masses to their objective needs. Examples of transitional demands listed in the document were, of course, meant as a guide for Marxists operating at the time in a wide range of countries, but they still offer much that is relevant to worker struggles today. For, for, for instance, Trotsky's demand for a sliding scale of wages and hours that is, guaranteed work and a real living wage for all, is as urgent in the current period of precarious work and poverty wages in 2023 as it was in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Linking this demand with that of a program of public works, again, another demand which retains its full force today, the expropriation of the banks and the need for a unified and systematic struggle for these on the part of the labor movement is very important. Trotsky explains that the claims of the capitalists that such policies would ruin their businesses only shows in practice that the choice faced by workers is either their control over the economy or their ruin under capitalism. Another example is the demand, open the books. Workers should demand this, not because we want to become bookkeepers, but in order to expose the lies and secrets of the corporate CEOs. Remember Galen Weston? telling a parliamentary committee recently that Loblaw did not make super profits due to price gouging during the pandemic? Yes, I'm sure you do. Well, why stop at taking over his books when we can take control of the whole supermarket chain and operate it at cost for the public good? But the demand, open the books, 
leads in that direction, has implications. Trotsky also raised the need for workers to fight using their own instruments of struggle. He calls for a struggle to raise the militancy of the trade unions than to replace their rotten leadership. At the same time, however, drawing from the experience of important industrial struggles in France in particular, he explains that the trade unions can only go so far that they are, that they are in no way a replacement. They can only go so far. <laughs> the truth is they are in no way a replacement for a revolutionary party and will likely be superseded by other broader organs of struggle as the situation becomes increasingly revolutionary. Uh, Soviets, it's the Russian word for workers' councils, factory councils that emerged in Spain and many other revolutionary situations, for example. He therefore warns against making a fetish of trade unionism. He presents the trade unions not as an end in themselves, but as rather a means quote, along the road to proletarian revolution, close quote. Trotsky's transitional demands are not limited to the economic field. The demand for electoral rights for all people over the age of 18, which is absent in, in, in many countries, including so-called democracies like the USA because of the color bar at the time, but the abolition of secret diplomacy and the exposure of the roots of race prejudice and all forms of national arrogance and chauvinism also form an important part of the transitional program. All the struggles of the masses, economic or political, must be combined as part of the socialist program. Permanent revolution. Drawing from his own personal experience of the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917, as well as the experience of the failed revolutions in China, 1927, and Spain, 1936-39, Trotsky reaffirms in the transitional program his theory of permanent revolution as a guide for revolutionaries in all relatively backward and colonially oppressed countries. Trotsky explains that in those countries which have not achieved the tasks of the democratic program, the removal of feudal property, uh, the achievement of national independence from imperialism, uh, the entrenchment of formal democratic rights, Bourgeoisie is so closely tied to imperialism and landlordism that it is utterly incapable of leading a struggle to achieve a single one of the outstanding tasks, and moreover, not on the basis of capitalism. Instead, the exploited masses led by the working class must wage this struggle themselves, and in doing so, inevitably raise their own demands, which go far beyond the democratic revolution and proceed into the struggle for socialism. Therefore, for Trotsky, in countries which still have a largely rural peasant economy, the slogan of workers and farmers government must be raised in order to forge an alliance between the two without which a revolution would be doomed to fail. However, he stresses that this alliance must be between the workers and poor peasants in opposition to the national bourgeoisie. The alliance can succeed only on the basis of the struggle for the dictatorship of the proletariat, not for the establishment of some impossible liberal democracy. He contrasts this demand with the infamous policy of people's fronts, popular fronts, which had resulted in the revolutions in China and Spain being be betrayed. Why? In order to maintain an alliance with the progressive or anti-fascist bourgeoisie. That's what the people's fronts were all about. This demand of the need for workers and peasants to break completely with the bourgeoisie not only of the imperialist countries, but break as well with their own bourgeoisie in order to win national independence would later be confirmed the world over in the wave of inspiring struggles against colonial rule, which resulted in the creation of numerous socialist regimes, which began on a purely nationalist basis, such as that of Cuba, ostensibly. Cuba's July 26th movement had the advantage of a revolutionary Marxist cadre led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and Vilma Espin and others who took the liberation process forward all the way. It is incumbent on socialists to support unconditionally national liberation struggles that confront a colonial settler state in their midst, as in the case of Palestine and Ireland. Those who make concessions to Zionism or to the orange statelet in the north of Ireland, arguing that Palestinian or Irish national liberation struggles divide the Ulster or Israeli working class, are not socialists. Such advocates are social imperialists. That's the term Marx applied 
to uh, socialists in Holland who were in favor of maintaining Indonesia as a colony. They're social imperialists acting blatantly against the transitional program and against basic working class solidarity. Tactics are important. It is not enough to possess a program and call on workers to rally to your banner. Finding itself in a small minority in the movement, far outweighed by the reformist and Stalinist labor bureaucracies, the Fourth International faced the immediate task of overcoming the dominance of the reformists and winning the most advanced sections of the workers and eventually the masses as a whole. In order to do this, Trotsky urged his followers to reject sectarianism and to orient to the workers' movement just as it is, as you find it, repeating the advice given by Lenin to the young communist international in the 1920s. On the question of trade unions, Trotsky explained that to refuse to join and fight within a union, even with an often reactionary leadership, was in effect to renounce all meaningful struggle. Abstention from struggle would only strengthen the influence of the right-wing leaders, while the Marxists remained isolated. Socialist action participates actively in the struggle against capitalist austerity, against the boss's attack on wages, for job security and pensions, and against the scourge of autocratic power, police surveillance, and state repression. Capital is divided on how soon to return to normal functioning, but it is united in its aim to roll back relief benefits, wage increases, and social expenditures. A ferocious battle is underway as restrictions due to the pandemic are fitfully lifted. To oppose the boss's agenda, we, we promote militant unity in action, including steps towards a general strike. The liberal NDP confidence and supply agreement undermines the working class. It gives the Trudeau liberals a license to hike war spending, subsidize big oil and gas, and, and delay the few promised uh, reforms that they uh, offered. The NDP should break with the Liberals now and consider the fate of government bills one by one. If it helps the workers, we can vote for it. If it doesn't, we shouldn't. SA is a strong opponent of class collaboration and a proponent of the Workers United Front. At the same time, you know from the manifesto of the quote, we disdain to conceal our views. That means, we insist on participating openly in movements of the working class and the oppressed. The struggle against racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia is a priority because victory over bigotry and discrimination is the only route to genuine working class unity. We strive to recruit to our party without hesitation or apology, the very best activists of those movements. Strategically, we strive for a workers' government based on mass working class self-organization and a worker state to abolish capitalism. The existential threat to nature posed by the profit system is a profound danger facing human civilization. Alongside the environmental movement together with indigenous people who have stood at the forefront of this struggle for generations, socialists continue to oppose new pipeline construction and to demand a rapid shift to green energy. That entails public ownership and workers' indigenous control of the resource sector. The effort to replace the misleaders of our class, traders, whether they are craven or brazen in their acts of, uh, of, of betrayal of the masses, will be driven by the critical self-activity of workers. One form this takes is the construction of class struggle unions or caucuses in every union and workplace. The workers' action movement, which contests the leadership in unions, and the NDP Socialist Caucus, which does the same in the NDP, both advance this perspective. We urge everyone to join us in building WAM and the Socialist Caucus. Five minutes. Quote, thank you. To face reality squarely, not to seek the line of least resistance, to call things by their right names, to speak the truth to the masses, no matter how bitter it may be, not to fear obstacles, to be true in little things as in big ones, to base one's program on the logic of the class struggle, to be bold when the hour of action arrives. Quote, it is in these immortal words that Trotsky laid out the rules of the Fourth International. Today, the Fourth International is fragmented and its main organization has turned away from revolutionary party building. But the new generation of Marxists must inscribe the transitional program on their banner in preparation for the monumental struggles to come. That's the value of the transitional program. It's why we study it and why we take 
it, those gems, those demands from it. It's a toolkit. It's not a tool to be applied everywhere and always in the same way. That's sectarianism. It is a toolkit from which we draw the instruments to advance the struggles of our class, confident that we can make progress by sticking to the Marxist method. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Okay, our next speaker is Florencia Shade. She is a leading member of Socialist Action and the NDP Socialist Caucus. She is a mother, a writer, and researcher who resides with her indigenous par partner in Terrace, BC. Welcome back again, Flo. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Um, okay, so in, in this part, I'm going to give a rundown on the work that we've been doing within the NDP uh, Socialist Caucus since I've become pretty significantly involved in it this year. Uh, through Socialist Action. So my entry into the SC, or Socialist Caucus, really began with the whirlwind leadership campaign here in BC, which almost led to a leadership vote after Horgan resigned. However, Anjali Epidurai, a young eco-socialist leading an insurgent campaign against the status quo pick David Eby, was shamefully disqualified on bogus allegations, cheating, and bad faith weaponization of procedural technicalities. The entire thing was a heartbreaking sham, reminding me again of how Bernie got steamrolled by the Democrats in 2020. It's not the first and won't be the last time the bourgeois machine will act to mitigate a threat to power. However, her campaign was very popular and actually brought in an estimated 13,000 new members to the BC NDP, which by all accounts would have led Angeli to winning the premiership as there was only about 10,000 or so members left within the BC NDP in the province. So clearly this posed an unthinkable risk to, conserv to the conservative NDP that run the province and the headquarters. So instead, they lied and ruth ruthlessly smeared her and her supporters, given cover at every stage by the corporate media. Nevertheless, it provided a great opportunity for the BC Socialist Caucus to prepare an ideal candidate platform, which we worked on throughout the summer and into the fall of 2021 and presented to Anjali in discussion meetings where she was very amenable to hearing our perspective and political demands. While the scandal of her disqualification was a great blow and caused many to leave the party or disengage from electoral politics once again, it has not deterred the work of the Socialist Caucus, who never considered the party brass as allies to begin with, and we're not surprised, though still disheartened, to see how things went down. The work done in this campaign provided opportunities to network and organize with more NDP-based activists and groups on the BC and federal level. The Federal Socialist Caucus has since then become the site of most activity within the SC, as an organizing and resolution subcommittees were struck by December. The organizing committee was charged with outlining an engagement strategy in advance of the fall convention based on the pillars of a grassroots EDA work and connecting with elected officials from inside the party, B developing resolutions as a basis of unity and core program and getting them passed at convention, C running socialist candidates for NDP executive, and D utilizing media and external relations to generate public interest and momentum. The SC has been successful in building up these pillars, encouraging and helping socialist allies in the Socialist Caucus to join their executives of their electoral district associations, taking a grassroots approach to creating a presence in these sites of potential power, which in many cases have been left abandoned by the central party. This neglect in some ways poses an opportunity because the party structure still allows for some, though diminishing, important decisions to be run through or at least involve the EDA. I would say the majority, if not overwhelming majority by this point, of those in the Socialist Caucus Steering Committee are now in their federal EDAs, uh, most of them, I think, on the executive, but either way, uh, which is a wonderful position and basis for further ongoing organizing from the bottom up. Similarly, we have amassed the largest slate of candidates to run for NDP executive this fall than we have in years prior. Still waiting on whether we'll have a candidate for president, but filling ne nearly every other position for a robust socialist slate. This strategy will allow the Socialist Caucus members to take the mic more frequently at convention through candidate speeches and will bring attention to the activity and existence of the Socialist Caucus, which the NDP tries at every instance to hide and deny. But they can't really stop us doing our thing because we're not an official standing committee 
or other body sanctioned through the central office. So there isn't much they can do about us popping up for another round. We've recently struck a public relations committee to man manage public communication, social media, alt media, corporate media, and any other public engagement or media campaigns. A major component will be publishing the next issue of Turn Left magazine, very finely produced in-house publication of the Socialist Caucus, completed by our comrade Sean Kane. Next issue will be coming out in September, I believe, shortly before the federal NDP convention in mid-October. The resolution subcommittee was charged with developing a resolutions list covering all important policy demands to send to Ottawa with the idea of getting as many as possible to the convention floor for discussion and hopefully adoption. After a long series of meetings over the course of about six months, we democratically drafted and published a list of 24 resolutions, 13 of which were prioritized to cover broad topics of national political importance, which are unapologetically socialist in nature, though still appealing to the pertinent issues for current NDP members. To that end, five out of 13 of the, prior of the prioritized resolutions call for specific reforms that would advance democratization within the NDP. Party, which over the course of recent months especially, has flagrantly disabused its members of the notion that the rank and file hold any real power, without having to drag it forcefully from the clutches of the brass. There is a mix of democratic demands whose adoption would give more operational space within the party for grassroots to maneuver and communicate, as well as some transitional demands that would restructure power relations between class forces, such as calls for industry nationalization, federal jobs guarantee, and a shortened work week. These resolutions have been sent with a preamble explaining what to do with them to the email contacts of all the EDAs across the country, which were listed publicly on the Elections Canada website. Many of the EDAs did not have email contacts listed or simply had duplicate stand in. However, we sent the resolutions to at least 155 individual contacts across Canada, Obtaining the contact list was itself a result of our united front work with other NDP activist groups and a reflection of our productive work within and between organizations. This was a major accomplishment for the Socialist Caucus this year and represents a new chapter branching out wider into more united front organizations within the NDP. Now the task ahead lies mainly on implementing media campaigns to get the word out, developing the profiles and articles of the executive candidates to be publicized and turned left and elsewhere, obtaining delegate credentials for convention for all of our allies within the NDP membership and executive bodies, such as federal council, and continuing dialogue regarding resolutions, policies, and organizing around socialism and democracy, engaging with the public as well as other left and labor organizations. We're preparing for one hell of a convention this year, where if we continue along the momentum and progress we have been generating, should result in a boost for Socialist Caucus recruitment and public profile. Lastly, I'll mention the work then the BC Socialist Caucus has recently restarted and begun to heat up again as well. We're likewise preparing for a convention in the fall in mid-November. As the BC NDP is the governing party here, there is much discontent to work with and the possibility to have our voices be heard and amend governing policy. We have been gaining recruits and recently striking a resolutions committee and will seek to mirror to the extent that we can the tactical model of the Federal Socialist Caucus. So that's what we've been up to. If anyone's interested to find out more, get more involved, please contact myself or Barry or Gary or anyone on the CC to get directed to the next meeting. And now I just wanted to spend a moment on the perennial question of why do we even work in the NDP? Uh, it's at base a social democratic party with bourgeois leadership, an increasingly anti-democratic stranglehold on party operations. I won't get too much here into the theoretical stuff, given we've already talked about it in this conference a bit, and we can happy to dive into that more in the Q and A. Um, and we've just heard about the transitional program, but it's worthwhile to note that there is this is a tactic that meets the working class where they're at, at the level of class consciousness where we find the majority of workers to be. This is expressed as the fact that it's still a labor-based party with the majority of labor union affiliations, although the fecklessness of current leadership has seemingly put a dent even into that trend as unions drift farther to the right. Now, this state of affairs, the level of class consciousness widespread within working class, is very much not static or forever predetermined. It can and will be affected by the forces of class relations, 
deteriorating material conditions and the tactics engaged by revolutionary socialists. The landscape we are facing right now seems unlikely to be the same one we will face in a few years even, as political alliances and theoretical commitments continue to shift wildly, producing seemingly confusing phenomena of populism and radical polarization. We intend to demonstrate to disillusioned folks inside and outside the NDP, engaged or disengaged with electoral politics, that there are still committed, principled socialists ready to fight, win or lose, to further the interests of the working class as a whole, who will not be deterred or distracted away from the core organizing work. No matter what number of bad faith smears, misinformation, or attacks may be mounted by bourgeois reaction. Demonstrated leadership, courage, and commitment to principles, rather than political opportunism or careerism, will help expose the bankrupt hypocrisy and propagandistic misguidance of the current establishment. It will be through the trials and tribulations the revolutionary comrades undergo in their dalliances with the defenders of institutional power that will illuminate the path for others to follow. It will be a way to catch those disaffected by the capitalist overreach. Following the principles laid out in the transitional program should protect the party from becoming too entangled in United Front work that it becomes subsumed to other interests or goals, which is more of a risk within the Stalinist popular front or people's front. Key factors include maintaining political independence and the right to openly criticize leadership, as well as a flexibility in ad adapting and reorienting of tactics as called for by an informed analysis of the political situation. So I'll leave off with three quotes from Trotsky's transitional program to tie it all together. He states, it's impossible in advance to foresee what will be the concrete stages of the revolutionary mobilization of the masses. The, section of the, four, the sections of the Fourth International should critically orient themselves at each new stage and advance such slogans as will aid the striving of the workers for independent politics, deepen the class struggle of these politics, destroy reformist and pacifist delusions, strengthen the connection of the vanguard with the masses, and prepare, the revolutionary, prepare for the revolutionary conquest of power. Next one's a bit farther down. Not one of the transitional demands can be fully met under the conditions of preserving the bourgeois regime. At the same time, the deepening of the social crisis will increase not only the sufferings of the masses, but also their impatience, persistence, and pressure. Ever new layers of the oppressed will raise their heads and come forward with their demands. Millions of toil-worn little men to whom the reference leaders never gave a thought will begin to pound insistently on the doors of the workers' organizations. The unemployed will join the movement, the agricultural workers, the ruined and semi-ruined farmers, the oppressed of the cities, the women workers, housewives, proletarianized layers of the intelligentsia. All of these will seek unity and leadership. And finally, probably my favorite quote, just uh, simply on tactics. All methods are good, which raise the class consciousness of the workers, their trust in their own forces, their readiness for self-sacrifice in the struggle. The impermissible methods are those which implant fear and submissiveness in the oppressed before their oppressors, which crush the spirit of protest and indignation, or substitute for the will of the masses, the will of the leaders, for conviction, compulsion, and for an analysis of reality, demagog demagogy, and frame up. That's okay. it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Flo. Very, very good. Okay, our third speaker is Julius R. Scott. He is a member of the executive board of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, and he was a delegate to the recent convention of the Canadian Labour Congress. He is a leading member of Socialist Action and the father of a beautiful one-year-old, Josephine, who is better known in SA as our, Josie, our littlest rebel. He lives in Toronto with his partner, Kelsey. Welcome again, Julius. I think you're muted, Julius. I don't can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. You hear me now? Okay, great. Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay, so I'll be giving a presentation on the transitional program and how socialists use it within the context of our work in the labor movement. 
Elizabeth introduced me. My name is Julius R. Scott. I'm a three-term executive board member uh, of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, uh, a member of the Workers' Action Movement, and of Socialist Action. So socialists have a duty to work within the labor movement. As an organized wing of the working class in Canada and around the world, labor unions and the labor movement are significant terrain in which we work to spread our ideal of independent working class politics and socialism. The labor movement is made up of workers. While it is true that the labor movement misleaders' actions have fostered the status quo and capitalism, the labor movement must be considered a necessary field of work to achieve socialism and workers' democracy. Trotsky's transitional program has had a profound impact on the way socialists approach and engage the labor union movement. The transitional program developed by Leon Trotsky in the 1930s aimed to bridge the gap between the immediate demands of workers and the broader goal of socialist revolution. It recognized that workers' struggles for better wages and working conditions could serve as a catalyst for mass action, revolutionary consciousness, and organization. The program emphasizes the importance of socialists actively participating in labor unions, not only to fight for immediate improvements, but also to educate and mobilize workers towards revolutionary goals. It encourages socialists to raise transitional demands that link the immediate struggles of workers with the need for broader social change. These demands, such as the demand for full employment or the reduction of the work week without loss of pay and benefits, aim to address workers' immediate needs while pointing towards the necessity of socialist transformation. By advocating for transitional demands within the labor move movement, socialists seek to challenge the limitations of reformism or social democracy and bureaucracy. They aim to develop a class-conscious, militant labor movement that is not satisfied with mere reforms, but actively seeks to transform the capitalist system. Furthermore, the transitional program emphasizes the importance of revolutionary leadership within the labor movement. Socialists should strive to build a revolutionary party that can guide the struggle of workers and provide them with a clear political perspective. This is what Socialist Action League per so uh, Action Socialist aims to do. The best way to get involved and fight for socialism is to join Socialist Action and then to join a labor union or get a unionized job. Once you're employed, reach out to your local steward and tell them that you want to get involved. Most unions and union locals are eager to pick up new people um, who want to get involved. Uh, they may expect you to do solely the work of, reg of a regular you know, steward work. Uh, which is important work, but the task of socialists in the labor movement is much more than that. This is where socialist action and applying the transitional program comes into play. Trotsky's transitional program has shaped the way socialists engage with the labor movement, encouraging them to link immediate demands with revolutionary objectives and to play an active role in organizing and educating workers towards socialist transformation. While we fight for transitional demands, we support reforms as well, if they capture the imagination and empower the working class. It's important to be engaged in independent campaigns for a worker's agenda, advancing immediate demands such as higher wages, no two-tier bargaining, for union democracy, against back-to-work legislation by any means, and linking those demands to mass action, while acknowledging that these demands are in fact not sufficient. We apply the transitional program in our work, but don't demand full communism now, or make maximal demands such as the full abolition of private property, the collectivization of agriculture, or the dictatorship of the proletariat, just to name a few examples. While maximal demands represent the ultimate goals of communist society, for the time being, these demands are alienating and ultra-left. Transitional demands bridge the gap between the present capitalist system and the eventual establishment of communism. Remember, we can't have socialism without the confidence, support, and participation of the working class. The role of socialists in the labor movement is not to observe or to simply fill union positions, 
but to be outspoken agitators, educators, and organizers. We do not disdain from expressing our political ideas and engaging in controversy when required. If we have a position on an issue, we express it and publicize it. We are openly aggressive on challenging business as usual, unionism, and concessions bargaining. We tell the truth. Working class consciousness will not happen spontaneously. It has to be organized. We are proponents of mass action to win gains, not behind the scenes maneuvers in closed rooms with no input or involvement of the rank and file. We run for union positions and emphasize our political program, not personality. We aim to raise awareness and draw together like-minded workers who want to build a class struggle left wing. The transitional program helps us a lot in determining what our demands will be. Unfortunately, many self-proclaimed leftists do not run for positions in their unions and end up supporting status quo candidates, or they become bureaucrats themselves. We run to try to build something. Even when we lose elections, and in most cases we lose elections, <laughs> our efforts contribute to building the class struggle left wing that we need. Elections are part of this process. Through this work, we gain the trust and confidence of workers. Consistency is key. We advance the Workers' Action Movement, or WAM, at every opportunity and aim to build it as a leading force, challenging business as usual politics in the labor movement. The Workers' Action Movement strives to foster militant democratic leadership to inspire union members to make a better world for the working class and humanity. There's a big appetite, appetite for change in our labor movement today. What's lacking is leadership. WAM stands for unions that engage in the class struggle. Unions should make organizing the unorganized a top priority. WAM supports international working class solidarity campaigns and calls for dramatic change in the union leadership. Status quo leaders will not deliver the change that workers need. WAM stands for democracy and all unions. It's time for serious change. And so far, only WAM offers that alternative. The current labor leadership is failing the working class. This seemingly harsh judgment is supported by a sober reflection of the major challenges facing humanity, especially concerning hyperinflation, war, and the environment. As grocery bills continue to go through the roof, the Canadian Labor Congress presents no plan of action to freeze prices, let alone to nationalize the giant profit-gouging monopoly food chains. The threat of nuclear holocaust looms as the inter-imperialist conflict between NATO and Russia over Ukraine escalates. While Ottawa spends over more, um, ever more on fight, fighter jets and warships, New Democratic Party and CLC tops ask only for more domestic jobs in the building of weapons of destruction. As a partner of the Supply and Confidence Pact that props up the Liberal minority federal government, the NDP guarantees passage of Liberal budgets that stoked the war machine. While more people globally suffer death due to heated pr prostration and famine, union leaders back pipelines and extensive carbon extraction projects, the truth is that there's no jobs on a dead planet. Radical change is needed, but a democratic deficit is robbing humanity of a decent future. In British Columbia, Angela Apuradai, um, I probably didn't get the last name there, uh, doubled the membership of the BC NDP, but the party brass and key union leaders decided to disqualify Angeli, leaving only one candidate in the race for leader, a pro-capitalist NDP cabinet minister. In Ontario, when it was high time to replace leader Andrea Horvath, NDP officials, minus any visible dissent from union heads, placed high financial barriers at the entry level, leaving only one candidate for the ONDP leader. So they conducted a leader confirmation ballot, but of course we don't know uh, what kind of support they got. Again, in Ontario, 55,000 CUPE education workers bravely defied Premier Doug Ford's anti-strike law in November, forcing him to withdraw it. But union tops did not push the struggle to increase staffing in schools so sorely needed. In New Brunswick, Tory Premier Blaine Higgs 
introduced legislation to make it more difficult for workers to strike. No mass job action has occurred to beat back that attack. Workers are joining unions, voting for positive change, which is uh, seen in OPSU with the new leadership of our union, but missing is a coordinated class struggle workers' leadership across the board. That's what the workers' action movement seeks to build, and there's no time to waste. So I want to go over uh, a few examples of some of the work that we have done in the last few years. Um, I, I, what I'm listing is work that I've sort of headed off on, on behalf of WAM uh, and as a member of Socialist Action. Uh, but of course, there are comrades in this call who have been active in the labor movement for decades and, and have many contributions as well. So here are a few of the recent victories that we've accomplished. Um, open bargaining resolution. This was a resolution which was submitted to the OPSU Executive Board and passed. This would provide support for any division or bargaining team which chooses to engage in open bargaining. Open bargaining promotes transparency, transparency and inclusivity in negotiations between unions and employers. It involves conducting bargaining sessions in a way that informs and involves union members. Open bargaining practices include providing updates, involving members in discussions and decision-making and seeking their input. This approach aims to foster solidarity, accountability, and active participation among workers. By practicing open bargaining, unions empower members to shape their working conditions and collective agreements, building trust and engagement. Uh, May Day events. We've gained the endorsement and donations from OPSU CEFPO in the amount of over $5,000 in the last three years to support the work of the Labor May Day Committee, of which Socialist Action is a major, major participant. Uh, Four-day work week with no loss in pay or benefit. This was a resolution which was sent to the OPSU convention. Uh, didn't get a time for a debate and, or, or discussion, but it was sent back to the executive board. It was adopted by the executive board and it calls on the union to support and campaign for a four day work week with no loss in pay or benefits. A four, -way, a four day work week provides the opportunity to rebalance employment, decrease the number of people who are overworked and the number who are unemployed and underemployed. It allows for greater gender equality through a more equal share of paid and unpaid work too, including the caring roles that disproportionately fall on women and better health and well-being for workers and their loved ones. On top of that, evidence shows that cutting working hours isn't only good for people, it's good for the planet. It lowers energy use, meaning less pollution, and an opportunity for us to live more sustainably and tackle the climate crisis. Um, another item that we won, remote work and flexible work arrangements. It's now a standing item on the OPSU Executive Board agendas. This was uh, after I brought forward a motion that called on OPSU to create a proposal for remote work, which would include the employer giving employees the opportunity to voluntarily participate in remote work or not, based on their unique and in individual circumstances. The proposal would include the process for requesting a remote work agreement, making sure workers are pro properly equipped for remote work and ensuring their requests are not unreasonably denied. So this is basically as a result of this resolution, it's a standing item and, a, and an ad hoc committee has been created between uh, OPSU, uh, AMAPSIO, which is a sort of a mid-management union, ALOC, which is a lawyer's um, union, um, and PEGO, which is Professional Engineers Government of Ontario, all working together to fight for the right of our members to have access to remote work and flexible work arrangements. As we did during the pandemic for over two years, we all worked from home. Uh, there was a protest action at Queens Park in August, 2022. This was as a, as a result of a motion that I brought forward calling on officers to initiate a visible public protest action to occur at Queens Park uh, to mark the return of Doug Ford's conservative government. Uh, and that it was further resolved that uh, officer would reach out to community and labor allies, including the Ontario Federation of Labor and the Toronto and York Region Labor Council to request support and participation in this protest event. And that event did take place. Uh, I played a role in gaining support for defined back to work legislation and in support of OPSU, OPSU Sector 3 Education Support Workers Wildcat Sympathy Strike. Uh, basically, when uh, there was rumors of Bill 28 coming through, 
Um, I, I kind of got the ball rolling, at least on the board, in terms of the need for OPSI to challenge that. And um, while I wasn't part of the discussions that took place, uh, it resulted in uh, in the, the board giving full support to Sector 3, which represented 8,000 broader public service members who Wildcat striked, uh, had, had launched a Wildcat strike in support of uh, the QP education support workers. Uh, we moved $1 million into the strike fund <laughs> of OPSU. Uh, this was, there was a surplus and there was a big fight and I managed to get a, mil a million bucks moved into the strike fund. Uh, we've continued to uh, campaign for a BDS of apartheid Israel. This is an ongoing uh, campaign that uh, we have been engaged in for a long time. And while we're slowly um, gaining support, um, we still have a ways to go. Um, I was also elected to the Strategic Planning Committee of OPSU, uh, where we uh, planned um, a, a, um, a retreat of the executive board and the most senior administrators and came up with the following strategic plan, which is a living document, but this is the first strategic plan that the unions ever had, as far as I know. So our vision is a more just Ontario for all workers. Our mission, building public service worker power to advance social and economic justice for all workers. Our strength is in our members, rooted in solidarity with each other, the labor movement, and our communities. Our values are accountability, inclusive, integrity, member-driven, worker-centered, transparency, diversity, anti-oppressive, and anti-racist. Our goals? workers challenging bosses and anti-worker legislation at a greater scale, collective bargaining leading to better and more inclusive contracts, healthy, active, and functional locals, increase meaningful member engagement, creating a culture that supports strategic risk taking. That was a big one. Removal of barriers to members becoming leaders at every level of the union, Members seeing clear actions to advance equity, combating anti-Black racism and anti-Indigeneity at every level of the organization. And we played a big role in pushing for all of this to be worker-centered and for taking risks. And my union, OPSU, represents 180,000 members, 180,000 workers in the Ontario uh, government, public sector workers and their families. We were elected to the Political Action Committee. This is a recent election. I've been promoting our own comrade, Kiri Vadavelu, and the MSA at every opportunity, uh, but it's a work in progress. We raised, uh, we put a motion forward to send uh, the Red Crescent uh, $20,000 um, as a result of the cat catastrophe that took place in Syria and Southern Turkey several months ago. Um, a few years ago, I ran for president of the Canadian Labour Congress. Uh, it was a large campaign. We had a full slate of candidates. Uh, we spoke to workers from coast to coast to coast uh, prior and during the convention, got a lot of support, and we have a strong presence now in the labour movement. And a lot of folks remembered that at the most recent, recent CLC uh, convention. Uh, which took place in Montreal a few weeks ago. And um, we also demonstrated support for healthcare workers against the antisocial convoy organized by the far right. I was regularly calling on action to be taken by the labor movement in support of healthcare workers, but also put forward a motion uh, that obviously opposed Trudeau's undemocratic, undemocratic Emergencies Act, and that was OPSU's official position as a result of our motion. So I'll just conclude to say here that it's it's a crucial that we all that we aid all struggles that advance a worker's agenda, including the fight for a worker's government. We must work with our allies to advance a worker's agenda. Opposing austerity means opposing the capitalist agenda and fighting for a socialist alternative. No one, no other organization in the Canadian left or in the Canadian labor movement is as successful at this kind of work as we are. I want to I want to bring that into focus. Nobody else is doing this. 
So One minute. I will conclude there. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay. So thank you to all of our presenters. Excellent pres pre presentations. And now we're going to go, as we always have, to the Q&A. And everybody has three minutes to make an intervention or ask a question. And each panelist has up to three minutes to answer, if they wish to answer. Okay, so I uh, I know the presentations were very, very good, but there must be some questions from somebody. I'm still waiting. You must have a question, Gary. No, I thought those were very excellent presentations, both how to work in the NDP and how to work in unions. I've never heard such well-presented practical uh, recommendations and Barry's description of the transitional program was uh, really good. This is a, that's what happens when you get three good presentations, you kind of overwhelm the audience. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm left speechless, I'm left <laughs> speechless. Can you believe that, Elizabeth? <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> That's the reason I called up on you because I thought, my goodness, there's something wrong here. <laughs> okay, in saying that, I will move to Kerry. Go ahead, Kerry. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so my question uh, for um, uh, all three of them is, uh, how can we um, uh, protect the activists that are being axed by these labor unions as radicals and left uh, to hang for them? I mean, left uh, without any help, and uh, um, it's 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 becoming a problem. I mean, labors are uh, starting to see, see the see the pain, and they are reacting. And these union bosses who are compatible are really uh, letting letting the act, active, conscious uh, labors uh, to fend for themselves when there's a struggle. So, how do we, as an, a leading organization as VAM, can help those uh, those who are alienated? by their status quo union bosses. Okay, Barry, go ahead, three minutes. Yeah, I, I'd like to answer that question and I have uh, comments on two other points, which I didn't uh, elaborate in my pre initial presentation. First of all, thanks, Kerry, for your question. How can we aid activists who are victimized? Well, I, I, I experienced victimization uh, in, in OSSTF. Where I, I was in OPSU for 15 wonderful years six years on the OPSU executive board, but then um, Mike Harris uh, uh, legislated me into uh, the, the uh, Ontario Teachers Federation, the secondary school federation component of it. And I was um, undemocratically removed from office uh, because I had a different notion of how uh, workers should establish their, their demands and should conduct a strike vote. Uh, in OSSDF, they don't allow that. They, uh, they, they decide which locals go on strike, if any, and on the basis of what, of what demands. So um, I, I called some meetings when, when I was um, victimized. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a mini campaign. And to answer the curious question now, we need to campaign for activists who are victimized. Uh, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't succeed. In my case, uh, I, I couldn't get back into OPSU and I couldn't get justice in OSSDF. But a campaign is worth waging, even if it doesn't lead to immediate victory, because it becomes part of the memory of a section of the working class that this person fought back. And that's what we have to do everywhere. So when you encounter an activist whose um, grievance is not being advanced, whose, uh, whose work is not being defended, whose position in the union is being disregarded or downgraded. We need to publicize it. We need to let people know that we are fighting back. We don't accept this, even if it's just publishing some articles that appear on some uh, progressive uh, social justice websites. That's what we have to do. Um, now, two more comments on transitional demands. Um, Julius hit pretty hard on this point, and I just want to amplify it. We don't propose all the demands of the transitional program at once, particularly the need for a socialist transformation of society. And you may laugh, who on earth would demand all the, the demands in the transitional program? Well, believe it or not, 
there are organizations that I could <laughs> who say that if you're not advancing all the demands of the transitional program, if you don't form a caucus in a union on the basis of all of the demands, then you're a sellout, a traitor, and, and um, disreputable. So you know, we think the transitional program is a toolkit, not a tool. We need to draw from it what makes sense, addressing the present consciousness of our co-workers. 30 and seconds. Thinking their struggle to uh, the demand for a new society. Um, and there's an important indigenous uh, transitional demand that we have crafted before reconciliation, restitution. Now, there's another group on the left who I need to name names. Project that. They say re re reconciliation, uh, uh, socialist revolution before reconciliation. What that means is no fight for restitution. It means you're putting the socialist revolution as the immediate goal instead of restitution, instead of justice for indigenous people. That's sectarian, ultra left. It's a dead end. I think you know who I'm referring to when I when I Your say Your time's this. up, comrade. So we have a different approach to this matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm.